This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Jumbo everybody and hello everyone wherever you are in the world and a very warm welcome to our sunset safari drive all the way from Masimara. As always, my name is David and uh, filming with me today is Achi. Achi, how are you doing? Are you excited? Achi is just smiling and not telling me anything, but I can tell from the smile he is very excited. Warm welcome to all of you and remember most important, your questions, your comments, hashtag Safari Live gives us lots of joy. Please keep sending your questions, any comments you may have from what I'll be showing you. We have just started with a strong herd of buffaloes now and Archie is very excited to go back to the buffaloes and remember we are coming to you from Kenya in the Mara Game Reserve and specifically in the Mara Triangle. And how exciting to have little buffaloes there and some white birds hitchhiking on them. And we'll call those the cattle egrets. A bit warm now, and that's why you see these big buffaloes just rusting. Some of them could be chewing cat, ruminating, as we say. As usual, flicking their tails, flies, and what will happen as it cools off, they'll start rising up. They flick the tails, they flick their ears. All those irritating flies, they keep them away. Funny how flies to choose or choose to go to the very sensitive parts of the animals. The ears. There's an ox pick on top of that one there. Archie, if you look carefully, uh, there's a bird on top there. And yes, well done, Archie. And these are the ox pickers. And if you look at that patch where those two birds are, it looks a bit bare. The fire is gone and their beaks are like scissors. King's fire, that's a great comment. Yeah, buffaloes. And what I will do, me and Archie will count how many buffaloes are here. And I'll also say, yeah, buffaloes. I would guess it's a hundred, as I said earlier, plus. What I will want Archie to do, I will want Archie to count the females and I will count the males. Archie, are you with me? And then we'll see. Buffaloes any day is a good thing to see. You can see that one ruminating there. They must be having very strong ear muscles. You can tell when they keep flicking their muscles or their ears like that the whole day. Strange, you don't see the flies that are irritating this particular female here. And I'm saying the female because you can tell by the size of her horns, they're not as large, especially at the base. The ox picker comes in. So what I do not know is whether she's flicking because of the flies or the ox pickers or both. I'm still counting and I think we're pretty big hard here. So what we'll do, we'll try and go around on the other side and see how many buffaloes we may be having here in total. And if it cools up a little bit later, I'm sure they're all gonna rise and shine and start moving around. So what they're doing now is just to, you know, chew cut, what go ruminating as I said before. And I want to give you a different angle and see how it looks. Some are standing, some are laying down and a few are grazing. Actually, there's one that has a very pink nose there. Can you see that one, Archie? Thank you, Archie. That pink, that nose is very pink. I do not know what that could mean to me. I don't know whether it could be some skin infection. But yeah, I mean, that nose is very, very pink. I'll be finding out why this nose is very pink. But in the meantime, I want to take you all the way to South Africa. There's another young man who would like to say hello to all of you. Good afternoon. David, thank you for calling me a young man. Many thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Steve. I'm joined on camera by Craig. We are down here in the Sabi Sands, Juma, South Africa, where the weather is 23 degrees and 72 degrees Fahrenheit. It is a lovely afternoon out, and the rain has cleared up. It is a beautiful, beautiful afternoon. It's still a little bit, little bit windy, 
and we're going to see if maybe we can find any tracks of maybe Tingana this morning. The drone went out, we managed to find lions, we managed to find Hosanna, and uh, we found a hot spot, but unfortunately both James and Tristan were busy, and uh, then we weren't able to follow up on that hot spot, and then from the area where I had that hot spot, we didn't quite identify it, but you know, we get into that point where we're kind of sure it's a cat, and uh, then there was a leopard calling from that sort of general area, sound like Tingana, short sort of bursts, male call, and Impala were going nuts, but we didn't find him. So we're going to see if maybe we can find where the Duke might be, not far, I'm sure, from where Hosanna was originally found. As we know, these two have a little bit of a, a father-son bromance, which is really, really interesting. Please, ladies and gentlemen, feel free. Send your questions and comments, hashtag Safari Live, or jump on the YouTube chat stream. Let us know how you're doing this afternoon. It's a wonderful day out. Craig and I are excited. We don't know what it's going to herald, but after a little bit of rain, a little bit of sun, who knows what can materialize. As you know, this is all coming to you live from Juma and the Masai Mara. We have no doubt David is extremely excited to be out. He's such a lovely gentleman. And he's so proud to be showing you his home. I'm going to be joined out by Tristan shortly. I think he's got some plans to follow up on the little chief from this morning. It was really quite interesting watching James and the little chief this morning from the drone trying to do some hunting. It really is special to have that bird's eye view. But it's still very dry out. The rain doesn't seem to have done too much, but those little burnt areas where the fire has been, I'm sure with that little bit of rain, we're going to see it's a tiny flush in the next day or two. So we'll probably go have a little look at that and uh, see what else is potting out here in the African wilderness. And in the meantime, let's go over to Tristan himself and see exactly what his plans are. Well, good afternoon everyone and oh, welcome to our Sunset Safari. As Steve mentioned, my name is Tristan. On camera I've got Fergus this afternoon. And our plan, well, I think we're going to amble about and see what we can find. I'll go check up on where James last had Osana, see what he's been up to. But otherwise we're going to try and just kind of see what the day brings us. There's a bit of sunshine. Oh, hello Impalas. So we'll have a look at these guys. Why not? They're right in front of us. So we'll just see what the afternoon brings us. The sun has come out now, which is quite nice, and that means that hopefully we're going to get a little bit of action as it, the day heats up. It's still quite cool in comparison to a few days ago, but it is far, far, far better than what poor James and Steve dealt with yesterday afternoon in that rain and blustery wind and freezing cold so at least there's a bit of sunshine and sunshine generally promotes good game viewing we normally see a lot of animals moving about in the afternoon if the sun is out and that's normally because they go down for drink so we'll hang about the pans we'll go check treehouse dam i know steve's going to be around as well and between the two of us we'll just kind of scratch around now unfortunately the Inkahuma pride from this morning have all vanished they all went into Arethusa and, and continued south on their journey. I think they got a bit rattled by those evokers this morning and therefore decided to move off a little bit. But you'll see that these impalas are fairly wary. I'm pretty sure this is the same herd of impalas that has probably spent much of the day in this area and the one that Hosanna was terrorizing this morning. And they must have felt like they were between a rock and a hard place this morning because there was Hosanna, there was lions roaring all over the place. It really couldn't have been pleasant. To be, in a, to be in Impala overnight in the early hours of this morning because there were just threats coming from every direction. But they seem as though they came out of it unscathed and well, everybody looks quite fine about life at this stage. King Sai, I would say 4,122 give or take one or two. No, I'm joking. I honestly have absolutely no idea how many impalas are living on Juma at any one time. And because they move so much and we see them crossing Gauri Main, we see them crossing into Tortured, Buffelshook, um, Arethusa, it's really difficult to know. I mean, it, I think conditions um, will fluctuate that number, so will temperature, so will wind. 
Um, so, I mean, it varies. Day to day, it will be different. But I would say at any one time minimum, we would probably, there would probably be at least two to three hundred of these guys spread across Juma quite easily. In fact, maybe even more, it's difficult to say. But we've got one or two really big herds that are a number over 50, 60 individuals together and then lots of smaller groupings. So there's, there's a lot of them and they are, as you know, very common and we see them pretty regularly. And so it's always nice though. I quite like impalas. I know that they've got this bad reputation you know, amongst a lot of South African bush goers um, that they're boring and that people stopping for them is boring but for me an impala is a beautiful animal and it's often a great animal to stop with because the amount of times I've stopped with impalas and sat chatting like this and either heard other impalas alarm call or those very impalas oh bless you well and now what a frog in your throat or making an alarm call which is maybe what they were trying to kind of show me and, and is is numerous and from there you then find a predator so I find that they're a good animal to just stop and have a little look around and just see what's going on before kind of just dismissing them as a common antelope. Good well we are going to carry on and while we do that and try and see what else we can find David is still sitting with another herd animal except they're far more grumpy and far bigger than these impala. Been watching the buffaloes here, and you remember we saw one that had the red, you know, noose. And it was very pinkish, rather not red. And my guess was that could have been like you know a skin condition of a kind. I'm not sure it's this one that's been. Yes, well done, Archie. Look at that. And we've been trying to. I've been trying to think. There's a condition in human beings called vitiligo, or some kind of lack of melanin in that particular part of the nose and I wouldn't want to believe it got some uh, you know skin burn from the sun but I would say it could be a skin condition or it could be a genetic you know uh, happening on it and most likely is uh, could be a good idea I could see the offspring of this particular one or maybe it's mother and find out whether it was something running in it genetically but yes that's quite unusual I don't remember seeing another one with another pink nose like that and then he keeps walking Kimberly that's a great comment could be a sunburn and I thought it could be possibly that it could be possibly a sunburn it's very possible but I would think it's more of a skin condition uh, which is genetic because most buffaloes like now it's rather warm and they're out in the sun and if they would have any issues, I would think it would be more on the eyes. But on the skin, I highly doubt. We have strong sun here, but the buffaloes have always known when it's too strong. Either they get some good cover, or they stay under some trees, or when they stay under the grass, like you can see here now, the noses tend to be bending downwards and not looking up in the sky. So my guess is it could be more of a condition, of a genetic condition, than you know a skin issue. But those are very good thoughts. You never know. We had lots of them, uh, lots of uh, ox pickers on some of the buffaloes here. Like that one is having one riding on it. And this is the yellow build ox picker. We normally have two types of ox pickers either the yellow build or the red build ox picker. I'm trying to get a picture to see nicely how the ox pickers look like. Uh, Margarita, that's a very good question. You see, buffaloes are ruminants and they got four chambered stomachs. And what they will do, they keep feeding, they keep feeding, be it grass. And mainly, buffaloes are grazers. Once they have taken enough, they'll tend to rest. That's one big advantage of animals that do ruminate. And when they rest, they regurgitate what they have eaten and they rechew it again to be more fine particles. We're going to be looking back to these buffaloes again with Archie and you'll see some that are chewing cud and some that are not. And Margarita, that's what will happen. They tend to get the best is how in my village long time ago, I can't remember, maybe during my mother's time, our grandmother, who my grandmother especially, who is still alive, used to tell me, she even tells me today, long time, the women in the village would get bananas and just roast them in the fire. And once they would roast them in the fire, they would chew the bananas 
and then remove what they have same chewed from their mouth and feed to their children. So I'm trying to compare that explanation from my grandmother to what maybe the buffaloes or animals that ruminant do. So keep eating, cut into smaller pieces, swallow, eat, cut in smaller pieces, swallow. And then once you rest, like the one actually showing you there, you regurgitate. it. That means you bring it out of margarita and you chew it to more fine particles. And that way you get more nutrients from what you've chewed. That one seems to have an issue there on its genitalia, some swollen parts. I'm not sure that's very normal. I'm seeing some very interesting uh, uh, ideas during the buffaloes. We had the pink nose, and then this one on the genitalia have like some swellings. But this also happens to the cows once in a while. It could be a kind of a tumor, who knows? And you can see it's not very comfortable as she keeps or keeps flicking the tail there. And the angle the tail is resting is not the way it should be because of that swelling there on the left side. Well, just like, you know, human beings, animals also get some kind of, uh, either some tumor or, I don't know, it's kind of some kind of a cancer. If we, I'm not a specialist, I would not be able to know. And if you look at the health condition of that particular one, it doesn't look very good. A lot of fire is missing on the body. And I'm not sure it's the effect of that. Is it time to have a wee? Yes, and that tells you she's definitely a girl and yes, so much issues on the genitalia part above the vagina there. Just near the anus, you can tell a lot of swellings in that area. Time to scratch. Excellent. Sorry, Megan, I missed your question about the Augsbaker. Oxpakers, yes, yes, and then we saw the interesting thing, and my oxpakers are still here. And we were seeing earlier the yellow billed oxpakers. If you come to me here, Archie, excellent. Uh, that's the yellow billed oxpakers on top there, and these are the ones that we saw on top of those buffaloes here. We got two types of oxpakers we got the yellow billed oxpaker, and we also got the red billed oxpaker. I remember when I was in South Africa, Koprova, weeks ago, I kept seeing more red billed oxpakers than the yellow billed oxpakers. Let's now go to the red billed oxpakers and see the difference between the two. And there is on top there, well done, Archie, that's the red build ox pickers and the main difference would be on their beaks as the name suggests yellow blade or red build the red bill is all red all the way on the beak but the yellow bill ox pickers have both yellow and red but when you see the immature ones like the one you see there they got not very clear red or yellow this being an immature of a red build ox picker does not have any amount of red in it until it matures from immature becomes a juvenile one and then it becomes an adult all righty we'll have to move on now i've done a bit of study on those uh, buffaloes but i think tristan got uh, an interesting cut in south africa Well, we do have probably the most interesting cat. Hello, Hosanna. Welcome to this afternoon's show. He's busy as normal doing his thing and, well, slinking about. And so we're going to keep following him. It looks as though he might be a bit hungry, actually. And he was quite funny because he walked along the sort of edge of Trias Dam. We saw his tracks and Steve said, have you got any luck? And I said, no, there's tracks here, but I don't see any sign of him. And then Fergus said, no, but there he is right next to us. So he was just walking along right next to, kind of parallel with us. And he's now just crossed over the dam wall at Treehouse and is sitting and watching what's going on. And as he was walking along, there was a bird that made a bit of a noise and he just growled at it. So he said, no, don't shout at me. I'm, I'm just merely walking. And so he seems as though he's probably somehow spotted something over the dam wall, which he's very interested in. You can see he's kind of got this face that's staring in that direction. His tail's twitching a little bit as well, so I'm hoping that for his case that there's maybe a little steenbok or a diker that's around that he's deciding whether or not he's going to hunt. Now it's a bit of deja vu to have Hosanna back at Treehouse Dam and we've spoken about it a lot that this was his favorite haunt last year. He used to spend a lot of time here hunting and doing his thing so it's nice to actually have him here in this area again. I just hope that he's not spreading his wings too much. He needs to go back towards the pan so that we don't see him 
disappearing south and west. I know it's selfish, but we want him all for ourselves here on Juma. We don't want him to go further afield where we can't see him anymore because I quite like having him around these days. And hello. I love when he does that. He does it often where he's just walking and doesn't kind of break stride. He just kind of starts grooming himself as he goes. Now I'm going to keep up with him because he will disappear fairly quickly and we know he's an active boy. So Kimberly, you say oh, hello, Hosanna. It's so lovely to see you again. Yes, it is lovely to see him, isn't it? So he's, I mean, he's a fairly regular feature these days. In fact, I would like to know how many drives we've actually had Hosanna on drive since he arrived back. It would be very interesting to me to know how many times he's appeared since he's arrived back and how many drives we've actually seen him. I know there's been one or two where we haven't seen him at all, but for the most part, we've almost seen him every single drive, which has been quite phenomenal. It's, it's not every day that you're going to get a leopard like this. I mean, even a female leopard with cubs, we know with Tandy, we used to go quite a few days without finding her sometimes and yet Hosanna we somehow manage every day he seems to kind of grace us with his presence and I say he graces us with his presence because a lot of the time he kind of appears rather than us actually finding no Catherine I don't think so I mean I don't think he comes out to me I mean James has had some a lot of sightings of him so is Steve and many of the sightings I've had have been you know thanks to everyone at watching the dam cam that has has shown him to us and and told us about that he's there so it's not really for me that I, I, I guess we have you know it, it's quite easy in that I can just go to certain places and know that he's going to be roughly in those areas and then from you know try and track him down from there but I don't think he necessarily gravitates towards me any more than he gravitates towards any of the other cars or, or guides or anything like that most people would be able to find him quite regularly I think I don't know maybe who knows with these things animals are quite something sometimes and particularly this one Pauline, I think it's just the excitement. It's it's much like salivation. It's much like us when we get kind of sweaty, when we get a, you know when when adrenaline starts to to go through their mind or starts to pump through the body. You know we start to have sweaty hands or something like that. So I think for them it's more just a case that they've seen something and it's their body's almost reaction. And you'll probably find that a lot of the females have that twitching tail in order to tell the cubs you stop there you mustn't move because I'm now hunting so it's a, almost a signal to the cubs that hang on there's something up here in front that I need to investigate and the cub can then stop and maybe that's in learned behavior that then carries through even into the males as they go through life they see their mom's tail twitching so much that they learn from it but I mean it's 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 pretty much just a body response to something that makes them excited there's probably a rush of adrenaline and that's just part of the twitch that they get when they start to think and start to kind of express some sort of emotion now I wonder where he's going at the moment it it's amazes me how every time we kind of find him he's generally not doing too much and then we start to walk with him and he almost oh, start to find him and then he starts to walk and oh, as if to say all right guys we've been waiting for you all day it's time to go for a bit of a walk time to go and see what I can explore and what I can find which is quite fine by me I quite enjoy having an active Hosanna it's always nice to be up and about with him as we go and it's part of the reason why many of us enjoy following him is because he's not the most you know sleepy cat his dad is far sleepier than what he is the thing is with him though is he will get there eventually he will as he becomes more dominant and older so his youthfulness will run out and he'll start to probably sleep more and mess around and walk around less I hope that it doesn't change it would be nice if he didn't ever change but and you know most male leopards tend to go that way right so Sana, where are you going to go you're going to go to the big mound in front of you I don't know. I think he might go into the drainage line here and maybe just find a nice spot to sit for a while before he contemplates his next move. It's still a bit early in the day for him to be hunting, so I would imagine that he's, you know, kind of just looking around and just trying to see somewhere where he can take a bit of a rest for now and then we'll maybe hunt a little bit later in the evening. But he's just stopped again, so let's carry on there, Fergus. Let's try to get a little clues up. Right, now while we head off in this direction and try and get into a better position to see little Hosanna, let's send you back across to Steve and see if he's had any luck yet with, well, Tingana's dad. Ah, uh, Hosanna's dad. Well, thank you, Justin. If anyone was going to find Hosanna to be you, but uh, if anyone was going to find Hosanna to be you, 
And uh, I bet you he waited for you to find him and then he started moving. That is what Hosanna likes to do. We've got a herd of impala up here. The first animal that we have seen this afternoon. So we're going to show you them through a little bit of a thicket. Well done Tristan for finding Hosanna. I'm sure you're not upset that we see him every single day. Doesn't get boring. He is an absolutely marvelous individual. And uh, the reason why impala hang out in herds like this is because there are leopards around and uh, it is safe to be in numbers. Even though the dry season is upon us, the vegetation is lacking a lot of its sort of nutrients. It still pays to be in a herd because it's a bit selfish really. You kind of stand in the middle and hopefully one of the guys on the outside gets taken. And when we watch the leopards hunting, it's quite interesting to see that the larger the herds that they have, the larger the herd is, the less chance there is of a leopard actually catching one of them. Nikita, you want to know if impala are born without a scent? Well, I'm not 100% sure about impala. I think it's possible that the baby impalas are. I know lots of small antelope or lots of babies when they're born are completely scentless, which is quite interesting. And they often get hidden in the long grass uh, away from the prying eyes of predators. But impala... I think they don't have a scent when they're born. I'm not 100% sure about impala. I know waterbuck and a couple others don't have any smell. But what impala do quite early on is they have these little nursery groups. You'll find uh, one or two females hanging around with, with a herd of 30, 40 little youngsters. It's the cutest thing ever. And you see that time of year, you see baby impala getting munched on like candy by all the predators. And you think that that makes a huge dent in the population. But almost what 25 30 percent of the population breeds so that's an enormous increase in babies at one time and yes a lot of them do die and get fed upon but so many survive and it's why well, that strategy is why impala are so successful they're all a little bit alert you can see the lone bull uh, not bull the lone ram in the middle there he still thinks there's some breeding females around as he herds them together. The rut, the second rut, seemingly fully underway. We heard quite a few noises this morning. It's nowhere near as vigorous as it has been. You can see how widely splayed his horns are. He's a magnificent specimen. See how they sort of start pointing out at the top. Hello, Rosalind. Do you know how big the horn is? Hmm, I'm not actually sure. I've never measured the horns. It's not something I'm too familiar with horn length. But that's too... F what do you say, Craig? You're good with measurements. Um, um, 18 inches? 16 inches? I really don't know. Rosalind, I'm sorry. I need to go and have a look up and find out horn length. But maybe, and I'm pretty sure one of the viewers out there will be able to hashtag Safari Live and let us know how long impala, impala horns are. And interestingly enough as well, the impala up in the Mara have got even bigger horns. See, he's having a little bit of a sniff. He's trying to find some female. She looks a little bit pregnant though, doesn't she? A little bit round on the belly. You can see that the the browsing animals start to, to lose a little bit of condition on their hips. The hips start to stand out, uh, but you can still see that the belly's quite round. If if they were not pregnant, the belly would be quite skinny. You see it on the young males and the young females. There's a young female there. She doesn't look to have the same sort of belly, does she? Look at her ribs. See, she's definitely not pregnant. She might even be too old. She does look a little bit old. But you can see how the condition is starting to wane on them. The dry season, the rain we had last night is only the beginning. But sometimes it's just a bit of a tease for the animals. It's just a, a cold day or two. A little, little bit of a light spattering of rain, but not really providing them with what they need. But I've no doubt with the amount of moisture we had, there's going to be a little bit of a flush, which is going to really benefit these animals because they are extremely selective feeders and will choose the best nourishment in and around in the savannah. Okay, well, we're going to go over to Tristan and his little chief who is moving. Let's see what his plans are.
Well, we'll see now. He's busy moving away from us quite quickly. He was kind of lurking about a termite mound here. It seemed as though he was watching something on the other side of the mound and then kind of got to the top of it, looked and then decided, nah, I'm not interested and carried on going. So, don't know what it was. I think there's some Franklins that are shouting here. Maybe he's watching them walking along. You can actually see his tail's gone up now as he moves off. But it's interesting to kind of think where he's kind of going and what he's up to. And to answer the question about the impala horns, I know that generally impala horns are around, so Steve wasn't far off, they reckon they're normally between 18 and 20 inches, that's a good size for a set of impala horns. The good news is that the sign of the way he's walking is just going straight back to the pad and if he carries on the route that he's going, it's the opposite of what I followed him the other day when he met up with Tingana, we're kind of going that opposite way and it's almost back towards where his pan is and his little Hosanna's haunt and that's where he's kind of heading. Now seeing Hosanna today is I suppose in many respects quite bittersweet and I'll tell you that why and shortly because a year ago today it was a day very similar to this. The sun was shining, it was a bit cold actually, I remember it being quite chilly and um, we hadn't seen Hosanna for quite some time actually. We hadn't seen him at all. We had or Shongile and we went to Galago Pan and the two of them were lying right there at the pan together for the first time in quite a while. I mean I think we had seen Hosanna a little bit but we hadn't seen much of them together at all and it was the first time that we had seen the two lying together for, for quite a long period and it was a joyous occasion because well you know any time you get to see those two together was always quite fun and it was so nice and sweet just to watch the two of them go about their thing. Now I'm going to try and catch up with him quickly um, and you know we spent the whole afternoon with him and then as the sun started to set so arrived Tandi and it was the first time that Tandi had really kind of asserted herself as the new sort of ruler of this area and the new dominant female and she went after Shongile and there was a massive fight that ensued as we all know and we had this kind of whole process that played out and, and Tamba was seen in the area and Tingana was heard that night coming into that section and calling and so there was all these leopards around and the fight carried on until I mean the last time I heard them fighting was at about 10.30 that night which is I suppose quite late into the night and that was the last time we saw Shongile I'm afraid which was, which was quite sad that a year ago today was the last time that we saw her. She was such a beautiful little leopard and I say it was, I mean in terms of us seeing her, you know, she could still be alive somewhere in Kruger and I hope that she is. Uh, I mean it's it's obviously something that we've discussed at length many many times as to her whereabouts, whether she's dead, whether she's alive and you know everyone's got their own theories and opinions and everyone's entitled to that and everyone's got their own kind of thought processes. For me realistically I don't think that she's still with us um, just because she was so relaxed and, and could have been somewhere. I mean she would have been seen somewhere going towards Kruger but the part of me hopes that I'm very very wrong and that she does appear somewhere in the sort of random parts of Kruger where somebody sees her and she's this beautiful leopardess with her own cubs and her own family that's what I really want and I will, this is one case where I really do want to be proved wrong but I, I just you know knowing how she was and how relaxed she was and that she never was seen again in this area would tell me that one fight like that wouldn't have ousted her and exiled her to the point where nobody ever saw her again or anywhere around us and she was too relaxed for her to go to another place and no one to find her so it's a difficult thing, it's an, you know, horrible to kind of think about that if she did maybe sustain injuries there that could have led to her demise. I don't think Tandi killed her, I do want to make that point very clear. I don't think Tandi killed her and ate her or anything silly like that, I think. Um, but I definitely think it's very possible that she got injured badly enough that she couldn't find food for herself or defend herself against maybe other predators and that's maybe what led, led to her demise. Uh, it's also you never know, I mean there's too many variables with five leopards in the same sighting as to what could have happened. I mean Tandi could have thought Tamba was at risk, Tandi could have, you know, Tingana could have come in and in the confusion attacked the wrong female or, you know, you never know what could have happened in that particular evening and what led to her kind of disappearing but I, I do hope that she's alive somewhere with my my kind of brain says that probably not. Now Jirako you say that you hope that she's happy somewhere in Kruger, your heart hopes that she's happy in Kruger, I think everyone does, I think all of us hope that she's somewhere, and she's like, if she is somewhere and she is get does get seen one day there's going to be a very special cat that somebody is going to have the pleasure of actually viewing and 
And it would have been so nice had she stayed in this area. It would have been amazing to have watched her progression alongside Hosanna to see how well he's done. If she had been the same, it would have been a very spectacular kind of way to have, to have sent, well, to have kind of kept Karula's memory alive in, in many respects because, you know, Shongila was the last daughter and we know that Tani, while she's amazing and she's very cool, she's, she's an older female and so her lineage and her line is now the only kind of carrying forward component of the, of the Karula bloodline. So it would have been nice just to have had another female around and it just seemed that Karula's females all had bad luck. It was, you know, she really battled a lot to, other than Tandi and Shadow. I mean, obviously Shadow is not around, but the, the rest kind of just seemed to disappear into obscurity, unfortunately, in the form of Shivinzi and then obviously Shongile. Anyway, let's think of good things about Shungile. Actually, it might be a good time to ask what your favorite memory of Shungile is. Hashtag Safari Live, what your favorite memory was. Anyway, in the meantime, we'll keep following him and we'll send you back over to the Masai Mara to David, who I'm sure would have loved to have spent time with little Shungile. Well, thank you, Tristan, and I hope you will be, or you let us know at one point, the fate of Shungile. And we've got a big L here, a big boy. It's a huge bull by any standard, and I'm not sure it was Steve Ovo who was talking earlier about the impalas in the Mara, and he thought the impalas in the Mara got bigger rack of horns than the ones in South Africa. And for the elephants also, I'd want to see the boys here. The males tend to be slightly bit big in size than the ones I saw in South Africa. I could be wrong, but I might have picked up the males here being rather huge in size. Maybe not by much, but slightly bit bigger than the males in the Kruger National Park. So this big male was turning towards us earlier, and now he's just giving us his back, moving to a different direction. But I've always wondered, looking at the elephants, you always see they've got very wrinkled skins, and I've been trying to think all my life, I have only had one argument, that the wrinkled skin increases the surface area, and by having a larger surface area, that gives them better chances of cooling off, because I've always seen them flapping their ears to cool off. But I think the wrinkled skin they got makes the surface area to be much bigger, and in the process, they're able to lose much heat. And I don't know what happened when it's cold, they tend to have their skin not as wrinkled, and not having as many spaces between the skins just not you know to look very big so we've got another car just passing next to us and they're just enjoying the drive like us as we move away and our ellie has gone and you're going to be looking for something else in a few seconds all righty okay i want to turn around i have seen some giraffe from a distance from where i am and that's where i want to go now so just holding on for a minute what do you think our elephant is too far from here? What do you think of that? He's now kind of calm, unlike earlier. Thank you, Archie. He's not as... Thank you very much. He kept moving and moving. Sorry, Megan. What did Barbara ask whether has increased or decreased in the Mara? Very good, Barbara, and I will tell you, tourism in the Mara has increased, and my own research have told me tourism might have increased by a whole 10%. This is what we call our peak season, and our peak season is always the months of June, July, and sometimes early September. And since we have been doing what we're doing now, and I'm talking about Safari Live, what we do showing you Barbara and many other viewers, this wonderful wildlife that you have here. My own research have told me the numbers of tourism, or the number of tourists in this country has gone high. I personally think what we have drew, what we're doing now, have opened many people's eyes, Barbara, and I would say for a fact, the number of tourists have improved or has gone higher. The other day, we are very lucky, Barbara, as they move on, we were visited in our final control by the permanent secretary or the cabinet secretary in tourism and we had a great time with him and it was so good and he was very happy to see what we do and as he left he conquered with us that we have 
brought a lot of changes in this country in terms of tourism. All right, we're gonna keep moving. I can see some primates from a distance, what I call baboons. And the particular baboons we have in this part of East Africa, we call them the olive baboons. We got two species of baboons in East Africa. We got the olive baboons and we got the yellow baboons. What I can see here, I'm trying to bounce Archie at the back there, making sure he doesn't slip. What you can see ahead of me are what we call the yellow baboons. I mean the olive baboons, it's quite a big troop. It has big males, I can tell from the size, females, young ones. And you want to find out what they're feeding on here because baboons, just like human beings, are omnivores, grass, and both meat carnivores. They would be going for grasshoppers, crickets, any insect they can get. They would be also be going for rabbits, scrub hares, anything they can get. I've seen some of them even going for fawns or, you know, lambs of uh, antelopes. And tell me, Archie, is this a good angle here? All right, Archie's happy there. And take us all the way to those olive baboons and it's a mixed group. That's a big boy there. Look at an arc of that tail there, sitting down. And what do you want to dig there? Sometimes they'll dig for tubers or some roots from the grass. Or sometimes they dig worms. And Megan in the final control says that's so cool because I found out in South Africa we got totally different species of baboons that's called the chakma, which I only saw them there. I had never seen them before. So we are talking of the chakma, and here we'll be talking of the olive baboons and also the yellow baboons. Tiny, tiny young one there, and I think with the mother and they'll always land very quickly. So either they'll pick some seeds from the grass. Are you big enough to feed yourself? Or are you just playing with logs and sticks? You should be feeding. And what they do sometimes when they move logs like that, they turn the logs and they find some worms or some insect under them, or some termites, anything would be under there. They're very clever uh, primates, I would say. And I've always seen some very cheeky ones. If they turn the log or a boulder or a stone and they find they've got some worms or some insect lying there and the other big baboons will come close by, they just put the rock or the stone down and then they sit on it and they start scratching themselves until all the baboons have gone and then they turn it over again and they start eating. How beautiful. Sorry, Megan, what's the coffee cask? As they keep moving, try and get in closer to them. Sorry, Megan, I missed that question. Great question there, Megan. Can baboons use sticks as tools? As we go back to these baboons here, I have not seen baboons exactly doing that. What I have seen are uh, their cousins that I would call the gorillas. Sorry about that, Turkey. I've seen gorillas and chimpanzees using sticks as tools, and they've been known to dig on the ground for food. But baboons, I have not seen them doing that. What I found or what I've seen the baboons do is getting, say, a piece of grass, a long stalk of grass, and going to a tamad mound and pushing it right through the hole of a tamad mound. And when the soldiers, for example, think they're being attacked by someone, they come and they start biting that piece of grass. And then the baboons just pull up the piece of grass and they start feeding on the tamads. That I've seen the baboons doing, and more so these ones we are seeing here, the olive baboons. But I have not seen them using sticks to dig. And either way, they're very clever primates. And you can tell she is either digging something from that grass there, and as I said, either going for roots or for tubers. But in the meantime, we got antelopes in South Africa that love staying very close to water.
yes, well, sorry, we had some water buck that were drinking and have now moved back off into the thickets. We are at Bufusuk watering hole. We've got two very nice looking uh, fork-tailed drongos that had been dive bombing into the water and now they're giving themselves a proper little wash. Here we go, isn't that fantastic? They're very, very wet. They've flown into the water, gotten very, very wet, and then flown back to a very inaccessible bush, not close to the water, quite close to the water's edge, where they can preen and clean, get the dust out, get the parasites out, and uh, basically just to make themselves look very, very good for the upcoming week that is approaching. And it's possible that also the a little bit of rainfall we had yesterday just got all the feathers out of joint and they weren't really able to dry themselves so they get that sort of that musty sort of smell you know that damp smell so now they're able to go and shake all the the, the dirt out and all the water out and probably then they'll repreen themselves and zipping all of the feathers back into place a little bit of a shake. I wish I could do that with my body. Here we go. Oh, one just dive bombed again. Did he? Oopsie. <laughs> Very good. Dive bombing forktail drongos. That's awesome. Obviously, they don't want to submerge themselves because they might find it difficult to get out. So they're basically just hitting their chest on the water, trying not to get their wings too wet, and then they're moving that moisture through their body to, to distribute it through all of the feathers and shake themselves around. Okay, well these forktail drongos are going to keep doing their bathing duties this afternoon. Let's go over to Tristan who I think has got a fantastic view of the little chief. Well, we do have a fantastic view. I don't know if you can see him, but right above my head, right there, is where Hosanna is sitting. So he's just taking it very easy right next to us at the moment. We parked and he was quite far away and he's just wandered along and is now just sitting here. And I'm waiting for a squirrel that's about to start alarm calling at him because there's a squirrel not too far from where he currently is at the moment that is going to make a bit of a noise as soon as he steps onto the road. But he's just kind of weighing up his options. The problem is, is he's turned quite far south now. So he's going pretty much southwards towards Twin Dam's area instead of going northwards to his pan, which is naughty. Hosanna, you're not allowed to go south, you know that. Little Gary's out of bounds these days. You have to be a Juma cat from now on. Well, let's see, he's going straight to the east now, which I suppose is better than where he was going a little bit earlier, but hopefully he doesn't go into this drainage because it'll be very difficult to follow him. So, Karen, I'm not sure. I suppose it's possible that he knows his name, given that uh, you know it's said so much around him. I doubt it, though. I mean, you, yeah. I, I say Hosanna. He doesn't really look at me most of the time. If I say Hosanna, and sometimes I find myself. I know I shouldn't, but I find myself talking to him quite often when we're all fair, just driving around. It's not something you should do with a wild animal because they're not going to listen to you, nor are they your pets. But it just one of those things that happens I'm afraid but he doesn't respond he doesn't really look at us I mean every now and then you'll kind of glance over his shoulder if you are talking and he's and he kind of walks past but he doesn't seem to be too kind of concerned about the whole thing and definitely doesn't seem to be too worried about his name so I don't think so I mean I, th I think he can recognize voices but I don't think he has had any reason to recognize a name you know a lot of the theories of why dogs and things recognize their names is, is because they there's kind of reward at the end of it they get called and then there's food reward and those kind of things which there isn't with Hosanna and so I don't think that he actually I mean I mean, might be wrong maybe he does maybe I'm not giving him enough credit I'm sorry Hosanna if that is the case I do apologize now I believe a lot of you have been commenting about Shongile and your favorite kind of memories of him and most a lot of you are saying the bushwalks well the bushwalks I think were the favorite memories of probably 90% of the Safari Live guides I know that Brent, Jamie, James they had some incredible experiences with Shongile and Hosanna that far more than you know what I did or even Taylor or or you know obviously Scott didn't actually meet Shongile and, and um, Steve and Ralph neither but you know that James and 
and Jamie and, and Brent really did spend a lot of time with them and, and I know when I talk to any of them about Shungila that they always think about her fondly as this bushwalk cat that was just the most kind of amazing creature to spend time with on foot and you know she was, she was incredible. I luckily got her on bushwalk twice, not for very long periods of time but I did get to see her twice on bushwalk. Now we're just going to pull up alongside Hosanna at because he's now posing right next to us at the same high height as us, which is always very, very pleasant with him. But, uh, you know, it's, it, she was an incredible, incredible animal. And she, her tolerance on walks was in, uh, insane. So for those of you who don't know who Shongile is, she was Hosanna's sister, the leopard that we're looking at at the moment. And she disappeared, like I said, a year ago. And, and she had an incredibly relaxed nature with us on foot. And so we did a lot of bush walks where we used to track her and Hosanna when they were still cubs, when they were under, you know, Karula's care. And protection and she just had this tolerance for people on foot and far more than what Hosanna does I mean Hosanna was pretty relaxed but she was just on another level and she would allow us to sit very close to her and she would just go about her business and wouldn't care at all we, I'm sure it would have changed as she became a mother and, and became more territorial but for that period it was just unbelievable to watch her as she went about her business it was a very special thing to be a part of so that was amazing and I'm, I'm not surprised that a lot of you remember her as the bushwalk cat she was very very cool what are you doing Hosanna? sniffing quite a bit in the air now the air the wind is blowing kind of from his left to right at the moment and so I wonder if there's maybe just something that he's caught on the breeze. Anyway, while we sit with him and think about Shongile a little bit more, let's send you back across to David in the Mara and see what he's got for us now. You never know, Hosanna was a very smart leopard and as they left South Africa he was my favorite followed by the Duke Tingana. But the only one thing I can't remember is where I ever saw a leopard going for a fully grown ostrich. And we got the Maasai ostrich there on your frame. And please remember, keep asking us as many questions as you'd like. Your questions give us a lot of joy. Any comment? That you'd want to make on such a beautiful bird like this ostrich here which I want to believe it could be the largest bird in the world I could be wrong but I would wish just to compare it to the emus in Australia but I think in Africa this is our largest bird a couple of months ago, got a question from a viewer who asked me which is the largest bird in the world David Oh, in Africa, sorry, and I said a pelican. I don't know where my head was, but I was just thinking of maybe the highest flying, you know, the, the heaviest flying birds, and I thought of a pelican, but also we got uh, bastards, which are equally heavy birds, and then I started thinking of albatross, which you don't have in Africa, and then I forgot the ostrich. Well, very clear dimorphism, uh, very clear uh, sexual dimorphism in the ostriches, and this is definitely a male, I'm sure we all know, black and white. Linda, how are you? And you're saying this is the first ostrich you've seen on Safari Live. I do not know whether you've been always there, but I'm equally excited because since you started being live in the Mara, I don't think I've seen Linda any ostrich. This is the first one and I just told actually, you know what, I'm so excited it's an ostrich. The way Tristan gets excited seeing Hosanna or, you know, someone else seeing the lions. I saw the ostrich and I was like, wow, an ostrich. So again, as I was saying, this is a male ostrich. As you can see, it's black and white on the feathers and red legs and neck. If you see the females, I'm sure we know females are always grayish in color. And like any other bird feeding on seeds from the grass, if it definitely picks an insect there, it will definitely pick it up. Pauline, how are you? And that is an interesting uh, question. I can tell you, ostriches do not fly. And, you know, you're also saying, why do they have wings? And through evolution, I don't think they have ever been able to fly, but... The fact that they don't fly, Pauline, they'll get exactly all what they need. Because if they can feed themselves well without flying, one, 
two, they can defend themselves without flying because I would say, Pauline, the flying in many birds will always aid them to get away from there would be predators. For example, you get doves being attacked by falcons and what they would do is just fly and taking off. An ostrich will not fly, but ostriches, Pauline, I've seen them. I'm sure you know they're very, very fast birds, just like cheetahs. They'll just fly low. And if cornered, Pauline, an ostrich would kick and kick very hard. But also using their beak, if you look at that beak there, they have been known to poke eyes out of either hyenas or, you know, would be predators like lions. So I would say I've never known them flying and they would have wings. Maybe once in a while you see them flapping their wings. And especially during the mating dance, when you see ostriches, you know, doing some courtship dance, you'll see them dropping their wings and just, you know, moving them up and down. And that's the only way I would say they would have the wings. I don't see any other reason why Pauline or how they would use the wings for any other reason because they don't fly. But the village where I come from, we have always said that ostriches are very clever birds and if they would see fire somewhere, they would run there and especially if they have eggs, hatchlings or small little chicks with them, they would run there and using their wings, they would beat and kill the fire. Hopefully if you see that at one point, Pauline, it'll be interesting. But that could be the only thing I would say, or the reason I would say ostriches got wings. As you go back to it for another one quick look, I mean, it's wonderful just to see an ostrich in the savannah right there. See how he turns out, beautifully looking. And almost everything of an ostrich goes to good use. Nothing is wasted. I mean, we've got ostrich farms all over the world. And the feathers, or rather the bones of ostriches, have been claimed to be solid. And we've got locals, like in Africa, making jewelry with them. Of course, the poo, or the droppings of uh, ostriches, very good fertilizer. And it has also been claimed that some feathers of ostrich, I don't know what part of the feather or which feathers, uh, have got some electromagnetic, you know, uh, effect on them. And back in the village, I would remember if someone would come complaining, I got something in my eye that it cannot come out. You wash your eye, you splash your eye with water, you still feel this small little peck on it, and you tend to think it could be a piece of metal. I would hear people saying, can you get an ostrich feather? And that used to work magic. And that, you know, explains most likely ostriches maybe have electromagnetic on their feathers. Uh, Archie, if you come to me here, I want us to look and show Pauline and all the other viewers the differences between the males and the females. What we've been watching right down there and right there, thank you Archie, that is the male. You can see the black and white there. And apparently the one that we have on the screen there, if you look at the legs, they are more pink than this. And this, that's what we call the breeding plumage. And maybe she wants to look colorful like that and the girls might come around her. And now we're going to go to the ostrich, the female. Look at the ostrich female there. Very different. Brownish in color. Grayish. Not very bright. The legs and necks don't get pink. But an interesting point here, Pauline, and all the other nice viewers, when you look at the chicks there, down there, when they are all young, both males and females, they have the same color. But at a particular age, four, five, six months, as they get older, that's now when you're seeing males coming to, or males looking different from the females. Alrighty, we're going to be moving now. And thank you, Ostrich. Hopefully, we're going to see the girls around here. I haven't seen the females, but it's so nice to see the male. Okay, moving on. Yes, don't, keep, don't forget to keep sending questions through. Hashtag Safari Live as usual. Anything you'd want to know, any comments you'd want to make, like Pauline, that was fantastic. Well, Tristan lets us know what Hosanna is up to now. Well, we are still busy with Hosanna. He posed for us beautifully on a mound for a few minutes before deciding to 
carry on again and he's now walking straight north he listened to us he's going north directly towards where we want him to go and so i'm pretty sure whoever is watching dam cam this evening at some point he will appear tonight i think he's kind of heading in that direction it's going to take him a long time to get there he's quite far south than he normally is but he is going slowly in that direction now we were discussing Shongile and I believe a lot of you have been carrying on sending your memories and it's always such a nice thing to go down memory lane sometimes and just kind of remember all of these great sightings and many of you are talking about her proficiency at terrapin hunting. Her Hosanna and her both went through that phase for quite some time where they would go after every terrapin that moved as well as monitor lizards. Does anyone remember the monitor lizard sighting at the dam when Gari Dam had water in it and not dry like it is now and she grabbed that little monitor lizard. I think it was with Brent, if I'm not mistaken, that she had that. That was pretty incredible. I thoroughly enjoyed that sighting, actually, because she kind of showed quite a lot of prowess. And it was the first major thing that we saw her chase, if I remember correctly, you know, besides terrapin. So it was actually something that actively moved that she was able to get and to bring down. So kind of secure. I don't know, bring down is probably the right word, but she was able to secure it as a meal. So that was very, very cool. Um, what else? I believe a lot of you are commenting to the fact that she stood up to Tundi so efficiently. Well, she did. I, I, that was probably the most shocking thing about that sighting. I remember that sighting like it was yesterday. I thought about it a lot over the course of the last few weeks. And, Hosanna, what are you doing, boy? It's hard not to like this cat. Now he's playing with a log and he's scratching his claws. And Oh, there he goes. He's just running off now. But... Um, I remember that sighting very clearly because she, you know, she went from, she was a small girl, she did make no mistake that Shongile was a tiny little leopard when she had that fight with Tandi and she was way outclassed by Tandi in both experience, weight, size, everything like that. So she really did not have it easy at all. But she stood up to Tandi and she really did fight for her, her life, so to speak, and she was incredibly good at her, at defending herself. She really did defend herself very well, and I was surprised. I mean, in fact, she got a few blows to Tandi. Tandi ended up with a few claw marks on her face. I think Tandi was taken aback slightly in the first encounter, and then maybe just as the night wore on, Tandi realized that she was just that much more superior and that much more kind of physically more stronger than what Shungile was, and maybe that's what kind of... Her, you know her approaches and her boldness got more towards Shongile but it wasn't pretty incredible her ability to to stand up to that cat and to really make herself feel like or make us feel like she had a chance and, and she she stood up to herself with a bomb. The amazing part about that for me was the way that Hosanna also reacted in that he came back and basically just sat right next to his sister. Even when Tandi was growling and hissing, it would have been easy for him just to run away. Tandi wouldn't have chased him in any way whatsoever because, well, he was not her, her target. It's amazing also how Tandi realized who the target was in that whole thing. And, you know, he still sat with her and they kind of stayed together and, and he followed everyone around and it must have been such a confusing time for him too because he didn't really know what was going on there was this cat that was kind of related to him but chasing his sister it must have been very very difficult for poor little Hosanna at that point but he also too was a, showed an amazing kind of display for a leopard in that he really kind of went to his sister's side and just sat there and sat with her through this onslaught that she received from Tandi. So yeah, a very special cat indeed and you know it's always sad when you don't see these cats grow up and become these adult females. Now we are going to go through what can only be described as possibly the worst part of Juma which is this monkey orange thicket and I need to find a way through this so while I do that I'm going to send you off to Steve so that he can relieve us of our duties while we try and tackle this mess. Well, good luck, Tristan, getting through the thicket. We have found a little covey of Franklins. A little crested Franklin with a white supercilium there coming down the back of the eye. The dark beak and the orangey pink legs. They are very camouflaged in the, in the grass. And they are walking around pecking whatever grass seeds might be left, scratching through the dung of elephant and buffalo. We not far away from Buffalo watering hole now, so a fair amount of buffalo and elephant come down, providing and bringing all of the nutrients through, which then provide insects and also seeds for birds like this. And without those large moving animals, probably would be not too much food available. And do provide a lot of their food. 
and they are very camouflaged. The reason we stopped is it's very important to stop from time to time and just to listen. Um, not so long ago, Craig and I did it a medicinal Monday. We were at a tree just over there, and uh, Tingana that was lying on this termite mound watching us for a while. Uh, after we turned around and came back, we found him, and we were only about 50 meters away. I think he's quite interested in that discussion I had that day on the marula. It was a good one. Hey, Craig, it was a good one. Craig's not nodding his head, even though he didn't taste any of the liquids that I made. He was happy to eat the nuts, but he wasn't happy to eat, to try any of the liquid. I think the guys I work with think I'm a little bit mad, and they're also a bit scared of some of the things I create. Oh, Megs doesn't think I'm mad. Thanks, Megs. Megs, can you say that question again, please? I'm sorry. From Cal6, it sounds like a good question. Yes, Cal6, you want to know about quails. Okay, we do have a few quails. Let me show you quickly. Just got to wipe my screen. I'm sorry, it gets a little bit, a little bit dirty. Okay, let me just quickly open it up. We get little button quails. Those are the most common ones that we that we find. You don't often actually see them. Let me just spell it correctly. The Hottentot button quail and the Karakayan button quail. Let me go to the bird family. Here we get a number of the the small. I can't see the screen here, Craig. How's that for view? Yeah. Sorry about the fingerprint. Let me just give it one more wipe. Everything is so dusty out this time of year. Okay, so at the top we've got the harlequin quail. I don't think we get them here. The blue quail's not here. The hottentot down at the bottom with the current chain. These two little, these two little guys here, we do get them in the area. And the common quail as well. And they all make very strange noises. Let me play the, the current chain quail for you quickly. I'm going to have to play it through my hat. Hello? It's a bit mournful, isn't it? That's all you get to hear of it. It's just this very mournful sort of sort of call. And then the hot and tot. Oh, it says the data is missing. That's strange. Maybe it doesn't call. No? I'm sure I've heard it call before. Anyway, yeah, there's a couple that we get. The common, the Hottentot and the, the carrot chain are definitely ones that you will find in and around the, the low felt. The others I haven't seen myself personally, but they're very hard to come by. They'll hide in the long grass there, and uh, sometimes they scare the life out of you when you're walking, because as you walk in, they just poof, explode out of the long grass. But we don't farm quails or anything like that in and around this area. See, this is the tree that we were that we were looking at that one day. Not far at all from where Mr. Tingana himself was watching us. Hmm. No signs of him at all this afternoon. And we've been checking quite deliberately on the ground. But um, after a little bit of rain, and with vehicles driving, it's really difficult sometimes to get tracks. Unless it is a bit of a sandy sort of area, the soil actually gets quite hard. It gets a little bit tougher. And actually need a little bit more sort of disturbance on it to, to open that track up. But we're going to keep trying. And we're going to be going down Drakensberg Road towards the south. And let's see if we can find him. In the meantime, let's go back up to Mr. Gitu, who is on the road. Well, Steve, well done. Hopefully you'll be lucky. Let us know how it goes. I know you're such a good tracker, especially when you always jump out of the car and you look at the tracks of these cats. And I want to show you something that I think when leopards do bring one down, it's always something very massive. And we want to introduce you now to an antelope that I call the topi. Big, big topi there, and of all the big prey I've known, thank you very much, and Megan says, very nice from the final control. Leopards in general could be anything 35, 40 kilos, 
for the females, some males, 70, 75 kilos. This guy you see here could be 100 plus kilos in weight, almost 200 pounds. But I have once in a while seen huge male leopards, maybe the likes of uh, Tingan. Tingan is a very big male leopard in South Africa in Juma Private Game Reserve. But I have seen the big leopards here also in the Mara Triangle bringing down big antelopes like this. And again, this is what I call the topi. And this antelope is very similar to what you call sesebe in South Africa. One thing I've picked in the top is if actually you're going to get hold of that ear and make sure the ear doesn't move and look at the pattern of that ear, this reminds me of what I'd call the stone or the steinbok. Sorry, that's a lapwing there. Very, very noisy. Either she might be having some eggs around here and look at the beauty of that ear. I've always loved the pattern of the inner side of the ear. Eat as usual. Yeah, towels, getting the flies out. The colors of these animals are very interesting. Is one animal you see a combination of different colors, the brown, the grayish, the black. And I would say maybe that aids them to blend in away from the would-be predators. Time to have a break. So they'll always, you know, grab as much grass as they can, then they pose. Joy, how are you? And that's a great question. And uh, I would say, yes, we see the cox hard beast here. I would say almost the same family with the topis, and we see them here. And they don't have the same color as this. They tend to have one brown color. They don't have the mixed colors, Joy. So we do see the cox hard beast here, and they're different types of the hard beast. And the cock hard beast, if you look at the Thomson gazelles, which are much smaller than the cox hard beast, I would say, Going in the next size after the Thompson gazelles, the cox hat beast are the fastest, I would say, antelopes we got around here. So many times you'll see the cox hat beast together with the topis. And strange just to see him alone there eating. You might see one topi like that, but Joy, when you look at the cock hat beast in general, in general, they'll be moving in a small little herd, anything from five to ten. But to see one topi like that, it's very normal. All right, Toppy, keep eating and uh, make sure you don't get any leopards coming close to you. And we're going to move forward and look for more beautiful animals. Okay. From a distance, I can see some uh, zebras coming up. Hopefully, they will stay where they are and we're going to enjoy watching zebras. This is a great day today. Eh? Alia was talking about rumination with the uh, the, uh, with the buffaloes and there's a viewer who asked me that question and I'm gonna be telling you more on the rumination and when I look rumination with uh, us human beings but Hosanna could be on the move maybe yes maybe not Tristan Well, he is on the move at the moment. He's hunting warthogs. So he's seen a group of warthogs that he's now chasing, which is the first time I've seen him chase warthogs yet. So I haven't seen him go after warthogs very much, and he's not very skilled at it, but there they are. The warthogs are hit, and him, and the warthogs are straight ahead, and then he's just watching them as they're kind of moving away from him a little bit. So he's just kind of weighing up his options and trying to kind of pick it up and see where exactly he's going to position himself. I, I think he's a little light, probably, for the warthogs that we just saw now. Both of those warthogs look quite big, but let's just see how he goes about it. It's going to be something that he will hunt a lot when he gets a little bit bigger and a bit older. We know male leopards tend to have a, a taste for warthogs. Hosanna hasn't shown that yet, but I wonder if maybe this year now when we have the piglet season and, and the kind of breeding season for warthogs, if it's not going to be something high up on his menu and something he's going to start learning to actually go after, I doubt he'll pass up the opportunity to hunt little piglets. It's a perfect size snack for him, so I'm pretty sure that he will do it. What I'm going to try to do though is I want to try to get onto the road area so we're not clattering about and off-roading while he's trying to hunt. He is heading towards the road and the warthogs ran towards the road too, so I want to just try and get into that area before it becomes an issue. Now, careful there Ferg, there's a very horrible buffalo thorn. That is not going to be pleasant. Oh, ideally, we don't really want to be going 
this direction, but we're going to. I just don't want to get into a place where I'm blocking his hunting or we're making too much noise. So I'd rather be closer towards the road and have a long distance view of him in the meantime while he kind of figures it out. It's valuable learning experience for him to try and start hunting things like warthogs and so you know try and give him as much leeway as possible and it's actually quite interesting where he's hunting right now I don't know if any of you remember a few weeks ago we had this insane elephant sighting on foot it's at that exact termite mound where we were watching the elephants on foot the other day so quite strange to think you're sitting on that mound and now there's a leopard running around all over the place I suppose that's true of where we walk around here but it kind of just feels a bit different I don't know why it just does now let's see he should be what's that Fergus? It's like a territory, exactly. Now he should be coming out somewhere in this general vicinity. I lost him around that mound. Fergus, you see anything? Have you got him? Oh, there he is, yes. He's going up the mound itself. So you can see him just going up on top of the mound. And I'm pretty sure that's exactly where we sat, which is quite cool. So <laughs> that's where David and I sought refuge from the Ellies. You can see why it was a good spot, because the Ellies, up, when we were up there, could not see us, much like we can hardly see him. Now, I don't see any signs of the warthogs. I'm going to go forward a little bit, because there's a vehicle behind us that probably won't be able to see him too well. And the warthogs don't seem to be too close, so I can just roll along on the road and not have to stress too much that we're going to give him away. Oh. So he's just on top there. I think he's going to come in our direction towards where we are. Just kind of trying to keep an eye on him because when Hosanna hunts, it's one of those things you've got to be a bit careful of because he tends to move around very, very quickly and he tends to kind of shake you quite fast. So it's important just to kind of keep an eye on him as much as possible when he is in hunting mode. It's very difficult to see him on top of that mess of sticks and branches, but a great place for him to hide when watching prey animals. You can actually just see him quite nicely there. It looks like he's settling down, so I might actually go and reposition ourselves given he's settling if he was not settled and was still standing and watching and kind of tail twitching i might have left it but we'll wait for that vehicle to settle first because they're trying to get themselves into position and it's funny i yesterday i was two days ago when was it when we had the wild dogs i was saying that a, a friend of mine that was at singita um with me he was on a vehicle and there's another one that is also <laughs> from singita that is busy guiding a group of guests now that's in this particular vehicle so and lots of friends of mine that have come through in the last few days, which is always quite nice. Always nice to catch up with people that you haven't seen for quite some time. So nice to see him around as well. Now, for, for, yes, there we go. I was going to ask you, Fergus, as I can't hear anything, but now I've got comms again. So I will send you across to David in the Maasai Mara because my comms are being funny, and hopefully he'll have some interesting things to show you that are around. Well, good luck, Hosanna. You might or he might have changed his mind. And we got some zebras here that I was talking about before. And shortly before then, I was talking about rumination and how I was comparing that to human beings. And what crossed my mind is how ladies long time would, you know, semi-chew the food and then feed their children. And I was thinking in my, you know, if it was me those days, how would I know when to chew and when to stop? And then say, feed my younger brother or my sister, for example, if I was in my mother's shoes. Because chances are, if the food was too good, I would end up swallowing everything. Anyhow, zebras are non-ruminants. Unlike the buffaloes or many on top, zebras do not chew cut. You just get them, you know, grazing and eating as much grass as they can. And they tend always to survive very well, as much as they are non-ruminants. And Steve got a feathered friend at the moment. Yes, we do. We've got a very beautiful bird, one of the African hawk eagles that are resident on Juma. And what's very interesting is have a look at the big bulge on the front of the chest. That is the crop. That is where the bird has probably ingested, or not ingested really, but taken an enormous amount of food through its mouth into the crop where it actually stores it to bring it back to the nest or for later use. And we are not far from the nest. That There's a breeding nest just up in one of the trees up ahead. So maybe he's waiting for, I don't know what he's waiting for, to be honest. We saw it with a fish eagle the other day. 
it gives the birds the ability to bring food back to chicks on the nest or to a, a partner that might be waiting on the nest doing most of the incubation. But often they're seen in pairs, the hawk eagles, and uh, they would have a very high percentage of their diet would be Franklin, like we saw before. Other things such as guinea fowl as well. And they're very big into their game birds. And they can also take smaller mammals, such as squirrels, small hares even, hyraxes. We've even known to take bush babies and fruit bats, which is quite interesting. So quite a varied diet, and they're quite well known for being sort of that 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 two bird hunting sort of strategy. One will fly in and be uh, be sort of observed, and then they all move away, and then the second one comes in from the side and smashes them from a very stealthy position. Sarah, you want to know what the rarest bird is I have seen? Or the rarest bird we see here. The rarest bird we see here on Juma, I would say, is probably the ground hornbills, but that's mainly because they're endangered. There's not too many of them around. Um, I haven't yet seen a leopard faced vulture in the area. Uh, Cape vultures, I've seen once, only once in this area. I've seen leopard faced and Cape vultures in the Kruger Park. They are regarded as quite rare and endangered. Uh, the ground hornbill. Uh, but there's two rivers in the Kruger Park. The, Ulifans River, sort of in the middle, and then the Levuvu all the way up in the north. And on those two rivers, it's two very special owl species known as the uh, Pell's Fishing Owl, which is the largest owl that we have. And as the name implies, it is a fishing owl and is often outcompeted by uh, larger, larger raptors such as the fish eagle, as well as the giant eagle owl, which we see quite commonly. I'll show you a picture of the Pell's fishing owl, if you like. There's a nocturnal uh, hunting specialist, and they like to hang around watering points. And here I've got a nice picture of it. Sorry, my screen. My, I think my fingers are just grubby. Sorry, Crago. There we go. Enormous, big, black eyes. And it is a very large bird, 2.1 kilograms. It doesn't give away its its size there in this picture but those black eyes are very characteristic and that sits on a log, they often sit on logs perched watching the stream and they primarily feed on fish. Uh, they also feed on other things at other times of the year but they are a very big fish eating bird but there's not many of them left in South Africa and we need to conserve them. But anyway, lots of uh, lots of hawk eagles around and we're going to leave this individual to see what it is going to do. I suppose it's going to take its food back, maybe its partner is away foraging and it's waiting to see if it would like some of the dinner it's procured. Who knows? Who knows what it's going to do? But anyway, the crop is there. It is full. They have eaten. It has been a successful day for this bird. And in the meantime, let us go all the way back up to David Gitu in the Mara, who has got some zebra. I was saying earlier, you know, as much as zebras are non-ruminants, they tend to survive better even when the weather conditions are tough. If, for example, there's a drought, this little uh, had an ibis that went a bit, ah, ah, ah. I guess that was they're looking at finding out what could be happening in the other direction they're looking at. And like that zebra you see there, good looking zebra, if you look on the main, they tend to have a wee, Yes. Minamu, how do zebras keep themselves cool in the African heat? And there have always been the big debate, or not the debate, the stripes on the zebras, black and white, black absorbing more heat and the white tending to reflect heat away. And we have always wondered which stripes are more, is it the black stripes or is it the white stripes? To me, zebras tend to have more white than black and of course white tends to reflect the heat away. And they also have a coat of hair, you know, on top of their skin and that would also help, not making sure they don't absorb as much heat. But occasionally they'll also be seen or sometimes here they are like on ecotone areas, they tend to go close to some little bushes or little trees where they would get some shade. But you see, the white helps them more to keep themselves cool. If you look at this one here carefully, you can see the black and white. And 
this being what you call the common zebra or the bachelor zebra, you might think the number of the number of stripes are equal, black or white. But in general, I always tend to think Minamu they have more white than black, which is a big debate. Those two seems to be having a go on each other. I'm not sure for what reason. And it's all over, it's time to feed. And I was saying, even when we have big droughts in Africa or in certain areas, like in the Mara a couple of years ago, zebras, which are non ruminants, tend to survive better. They tend to adopt better. And we'll always tell a healthy or good looking zebra if a chicken pan on one of the manes on that, on top of the head, on top of the neck. And when the mane stays upright like that, like of a horse, you can tell that the zebra is doing perfectly well. Well, let's find out what Osana could be up to in South Africa with Tristan. Well, he stopped hunting his warthog and has now decided that it's time to do cuteness overload. He had his head down just now and was rubbing his head and yawning and kind of looking at us and just being typical Hosanna, a bit of a clown really. But he endears himself very quickly when he does those kind of things. It's difficult not to actually just sit and watch him and kind of be a little bit in awe of the fact that we get to spend so much time with such a, well, in the world terms, elusive shy cat that nobody else really gets to spend that much time with. And for, to have kind of been part of that process for the last few weeks, we, and to have spent as much time as we have with him has been probably one of those very special things that I don't know if we'll ever truly understand how lucky we all are, and including everybody that's watching, because, you know, it's not every day that you get to spend as much time. Fergus, have you ever spent this much time with a leopard before? No. Of like this? No, exactly. So Fergus is also saying, and Fergus has done a lot of wildlife filming in his life before, even Safari Live, and to spend so much time with a leopard is a very, very, very special thing indeed, and especially one as charming and as charismatic as this particular fella. So, Janet, it depends. Um, generally, on average, here in the Sabi Sands, we're looking at two two cubs. Um, quite common to have one. In the case of Tundi, she just had the one that we know about, but quite common to see one, two, sometimes three. Three is unusual in the Sabi Sands. In East Africa, three is, is fairly common. Um, in fact, even reported cases of four up there. But here, I don't think there's been ever a recorded case of four leopard cubs in the Sabi Sands. Um, area or in the Kruger area as far as I know might be wrong might have been you know it's a lot of the times leopard cubs don't get seen and, uh, until one might die and in areas outside of the Sabi sands where there's not as many trackers and there's not as many roads and places like the Kruger we've discussed it many times that there is, there's a lot of areas there that are so big that you won't actually see any sign of those leopards those leopards won't come across cars their entire life and so those ones we never know how many cubs they really have but the average for this particular section is is two and it's a good case study to have because we have such a high density of leopard and we fringe the kruger that it should theoretically carry and hold value going into the kruger itself as well so two is about an average um like i say sometimes one um, what you will find as well is that young females and very old females they tend to have smaller litters so one is quite common for a first-time mother um, and then as she goes a little bit older she then starts to maybe have two three through her her prime years and then as she gets very old again she'll start to go back down to kind of having just the one so maybe that's what happened with tandy you know she had two all her life her first litter her second her third um we're all two and then she had just the one in her fourth litter now so be interesting to see if she's going to have a fifth litter i think she will i mean I, I hope she will she's a feisty mom but a very cool mom to have around and that little clalumba if it's anything like that is such a such a cool little leopard and same as tumba i mean tumba was amazing and even bahuti and kuchava i'm sorry i said that she only had three litters she had four hasn't she four litters yes four four five five litters sorry my maths is not good this morning. I was just trying to remember all of them. So it was Wabayiza, then it was Bahuti, then Kuchava. No, it's four. Four litters until Klalamba. So Klalamba will make four. And her fifth one might be interesting to see. I wonder if she'll have a boy or a girl. Because well, they were all boys before Klalamba that survived. And then little Klalamba came along. And it's the first little girl that she's so far managing to get quite old. And it's obviously not out of danger yet. She's still got a long way to go. As we saw with Shangila, we were talking about Shangila just now. Shangila was over a year old when, well over a year old, when she had, you know, this inter interaction with Tandi and kind of disappeared. And so 
little Clalamba, even though she's gotten out of the really most dangerous phase of those first three months, she's still got a long way to go until she's an adult leopardess that is successful. And it'll be interesting to see how she does and where she goes and what she kind of gets up to over the course of her life and see whether she takes a bit of Tundi's territory or what's going to happen. You know, so much is unknown about what goes on around us on our northern side and our, even our eastern side to a degree. We know that Tundi goes into Torchwood, but we have no idea how far north in Kanyeni pushes, what other female leopards are up there, and therefore what other pressures little Klalamba will face as she goes through life. It's going to be a change in things now again i've got comms issues once more so i believe that i who am i linking to fergus no you're not linking there was a question uh, there was a question okay hold on hold on repeat it for me I've, I've go again megan let's try one more time so megan if you can hear me i've got no comms with megan anymore which is do cubs born at a certain time of year have like an advantage from so Lindsay, cubs born at a certain time of the year, thank you Fergus by the way, um, do they have more of an advantage? Uh, probably not, uh, I, I mean it's why leopards will give birth at random times of the year, um, they're quite happy to to do so any time of the year and that's because generally a leopard can find food. You'll find though that there is a period in the year where it's, it's somewhat easier and that's normally the lambing season, so um, the this, this spring into summer. The early summer is a good time for leopards mothers they can catch small carcasses which means that they can feed very quickly get back to the young and suckle as well as if the young is a little bit older can teach that one to young on small animal i mean teach that one to hunt on smallish animals hello hosanna now everybody out there needs to hope that hosanna stays exactly where he is for this afternoon because the sun is going to set directly behind his head once again like what we had the other day and so hopefully that will be the case if he stays where he is. I doubt he's going to stay that long. I mean, it's a long way away until the sun sets. But let's, one can hope that our little prince will sit as regally as he is now for the remainder of the afternoon. Isn't that beautiful? I think it's very, very spectacular. Now, Fergus, you will have to try and help me with things. Um, hopefully what we can do is maybe somehow just figure it out. This morning we had the same issue with our comms. And so I'm wondering if I just try and do the little patchwork system that we did earlier and see maybe I can get it right. Megan can you talk to me just while we're live just so that I can actually hear and see if I can hear you? No I'm not getting you Megs. Right now while I try and figure this out and try and fix what's going on let's send you back across to Steve who is just bumbling about. I am just driving at the moment. Oh hang on what is that high in the sky? We had some vultures this morning that had obviously followed up on an Unkuhuma kill. Let's see what it looks just looks like a vulture to me by the way it flies. And James Hendry has laid down the gauntlet of who can see the first Wahlberg's eagle. And that is definitely not a Wahlberg's eagle. Looks to me to be a white back. It's not the easiest. Oh, there's two of them. They're going into a kettle. A little thermal that is generating above. And they've probably spent the day sitting down there. They probably, the the Unkuhumas had some kill down on our southern boundary. We're not sure what it was. There were a few vultures found there this morning. And uh, the vultures have probably been sitting there all day, waiting for the heat. It hasn't been a warm day. It's taken all day for the clouds to clear. And now slowly the heat is hitting the ground and generating a thermal, which is going to hoist them high up into the sky and then allow them to be able to move off to wherever their roosting sites may be. Some of the vultures are still nesting or roosting at the moment. Coming towards the end of the season for them. Kelsix, you want to know what parrots we get here? Well, a very common parrot we get here is, is the brown-headed parrot. Um, I don't think you get the grey-headed around here. Grey-headed is quite a special bird uh, that you find up in Zimbabwe and further north and right up in the northern parts of Kruger you get them there and also the Mayer's parrot occurs in and around there. I don't think the Mayer's parrot has ever been here. They're beautiful little birds. They look just like parrots as the name would imply. <laughs> so you wouldn't mistake them for anything else. They're very pretty birds. We've actually got a, a couple nesting close to the dam cam. There's a little cavity in a tree there that they're using. I still haven't found the tree. I know that I've seen people on the dam cam uh, showing it to us. 
and then every now and again I have a little well I forget to really have a look around the dam There's so much is going on around the dam these days that when you get there you forget to um, <laughs> go and have a look at the hole in the tree there's a very camouflage animal we are still searching quite deliberately for any signs of of Tingana maybe even of Tundi but as I was saying after in the rain, unless the animals have moved in the mud, the ground gets quite hard, it gets quite difficult. It'll take a couple of days of driving on these roads to soften them again and to get that sort of that soft texture up and allow the tracks to be a little bit more easy to see. This is a beautiful Nyala. We're always paying attention to the Nyalas and the Kuru and the birds because um, when it's hard to track, well, these animals give us a very good idea of where they are. You see he's busy smelling and his ears are moving around. As the wind picks up, gets a bit jittery out there for these animals. This is a almost a mature adult. His horn is still a little bit of growth to be done, but he's probably quite a big guy. Beautiful, and he, like the impala, will be benefiting soon with the little flush that comes up from the vegetation, from the grass and any of the leaves. But we've had that little bit of rainfall. What the ground needs is a day or two of sunshine to, to bake it and to react and to cause the photosynthesis to start happening and the leaves to start pushing themselves out. And Yala, being a mixed feeder, does far better this time of year than their cousin the kudu who are exclusively browsers and I'm sure over the next few weeks we're going to be seeing some very skinny kudu very good King Sai they are very pretty we've all had the debate about which maybe we should do it again let's do a Twitter poll this afternoon shall we what is the most pretty antelope the kudu bull or the Nyala bull. Send through your tweets, Twitter, Nyala or Kuru. One word. It's uh... Okay, well, we just quickly get a little look in the grass there, but we're going to be running away to the Masai Mara, leaving our Steenbok here in the grass. Let's go to David and a gazelle. Well, from a stand, we got a Thompson gazelle. This is what we'd call our stand box in East Africa. And earlier, I was talking of one of the first, fastest small antelopes in Africa, which was the Thompson gazelle. And now we got a white hog there. You got a pig there in the foreground. If you look carefully, that greyish animal that seems to be kneeling down, grazing. It is a pig, watog, and you've seen the difference between the watog and the tummy. Uh, this one is, well, he is now flicking the tail, but you can look at the tummy there. The tail is constant on the move. Well done, Archie. See that? Always on the move. But the pig is not much. As much, of course, the different species of animals. But that's one major difference from what you can see on the screen there. The tummies keep moving and the, the warthog is moving on the right. Not flicking the tail at all. Maybe not. they're not very popular with the flies like the Thompson gazelles. And in the Mara where we are, so there's a vehicle way in the background there. This is the favorite food for the cheetahs. And that's a boy and both boys and guards will have the horns. I don't know why that he is running there. And from the background there, I can hear some bad knocking on a tree. And I would guess that would be a woodpecker, but that's way in the background. Time for a bit of a scratch. Hello there. Very fast, small little guys. They look tiny, but they're very swift. And Megan is enjoying our spring box from East Africa. King Fai is true, and this great comment you like how they wag their tails, and 
it's constant, you know. I do not know how much kilo, 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 uh, you know, just kilocalories they use to keep, you know, wagging those tails. I don't know from morning to afternoon or to the evening. But look at the three of them there. Choo, 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 choo. And the question is, is it always leaf flax or is it only flies? In the background, if you look carefully, there's a different species of antelope. Okay, fire still, hope you're still watching. And that is an impala. It's a huge male. And Steve Ovo earlier was talking about the impalas in East Africa having much bigger horns than the ones in South Africa. And I would agree with you, Steve. And he doesn't, or he's not moving or wagging his tail like the Tommies. Well, having said that, he does exactly that. But you can see the pace and the frequency is much different than the Tommies. I think the Tommies are smaller. Maybe the skin is much softer. And maybe they are more prone to the flies than the Impala. Because you look at the Tommy and look at the pace of them wagging their tails compared to the slowish, sluggish wagging of the Impala. Keep moving it, keep moving it. A similar species to this, but slightly bit bigger, would be the Grants Gazelle. And they would be definitely together, the Tommies and the Impala, because of safety in numbers. And the more you, they are together, it's good for them. They're able to be able to spot any predator from a distance. And let's find out, Steve Ovo, what you up to in South Africa as I move on looking for more game. Yes, well, we found a beautiful track of a lioness. And this is no doubt from the two, one of the two that we were with last night. Um, it's come exactly from the area we were in. And uh, you can see that the track is a little bit messy. And you can tell that it happened while it was still raining. You can see that by the fact that the soil particles inside are a little bit moist. It's a bit spongy from the wetness, um, but it hasn't really dried too much in the sunshine today. But what I wanted to show you is that now, because things are drying outside, that if Craig just tracks up from that, you'll see that because that's just a little sandy patch there, that's where the track is beautiful, but look at the conditions we have. The rest of the roads are hard and tough like that. No other tracks visible. So just when you get a little bit of a depression and a nice soft sort of sandy bit will you get some tracks. So that's what happens this time of year. After we've had some rain, the tracks become very difficult to see. Uh, every now and again, you get just one, just like that. And that looks like that small lioness from last night that uh, ended up joining the rest of the Unkuhumas with Tristan this morning. And her and her, her mum, I believe, I thought I was, I was um, correct in saying that the adult female last night was the youngest one. But Tristan corrected me and said it was the ridge-nosed female. And that was, in fact, her daughter. And they moved off and hunted last night after we left them. We could tell by the fact that they had an enormous belly. And uh, by the way they were moving, it seemed like they used the wind. <laughs> Sorry, Megs, you said the quiz. Who is the ultimate winner of the quiz this afternoon? Okay, so the Nyala has been given the prize for the most pretty of the antelope between Kudu and Nyala. And I must agree, I love Kudu. I do love Kudu, but I just like the size of the Kudu. But the Nyala, the way he dances, the way they perform, those beautiful long orange socks, the white on the face, they're a very pretty animal. Very, very pretty. So I will agree, they are the prettier of the two, and the Kudu are the bigger of the two. So you can't win both of them can you? you can't be the biggest and the prettiest sometimes the pretty has to be smaller but um, in the meantime we're still going to be checking these areas for any signs of a cat or two in the meantime let's go to David who's got himself a bird of prey I know Steve Ovo is very good in tracking but now I'll first give you a small little quiz and you tell me which the big but is there. There's a big raptor there, big bird of prey. But if you look to the right, there's a smaller bird. And we've got a very interesting scenario here. The bird on the right is called Foxtail Drongo. And birds of this size, I personally respect the Drongos. They're very small, but they're very, very courageous. So it's a law now, but if 
any other drongo will come and join this one here, you'll see them trying to mob the big bird of prey, which, as again, as I said, I want you to look at that raptor carefully, and you tell me who do you think that is. To the right is the foxtail drongo, and initially there were two, and what they're trying to do is to intimidate this big bird of prey here to go away. You see what they're doing? Okay. See that? Okay. They keep trying to fly over it. They're trying to poke its eyes. They just try to irritate it. Look at that. Now there are three. He or she isn't moving. She isn't being intimidated. But I can tell you, drongos are very small birds, but I've known them to have lots of courage. And they're never scared by the size of a, you know of a raptor like this one here remember i've posted that question to all of you nice viewers hashtag safari live and please send through your answers nikita you think it's a brown snake ego ah uh, keep trying ah uh, i'll get used the answer look on the shape of the head and most snake egos will have rounded heads but that's good guess, Nikita. You said brown snake eagle. As you should keep sending your answers. Hashtag Safari Live. But for the fact, we got the two there on the right, which are foctal drongos, and they are making sure this raptor will go. So they'll stay there for a couple of seconds and then go for it. And I can tell you, they're not going to let go until she leaves that area they have been known to go for the drongos the big raptors actually you think about leah you think about leah maybe not actually maybe not but not, that's not a very bad guess uh actually it could be but but not quite so we had a battle before we had a brown snake eagle before maybe not those two keep trying and i'm sure you have seen it keep going through your ids and i'm sure we might get the answer as I'm getting some news, there could be something interesting there. I'll give you one more look on that raptor there, and then I'm sure we'll be getting the answer to know who that is. The bat clear, maybe not quite. Or could it be this brown snake eagle? You got a paw there, keep trying. We've got a fox tail drongo there. I'll also get my far look as to have one more quick look on it. George Bobot's ego, and I think you're right. Wallbox ego, I think that could be it, because I initially thought it was a Tony. But I think this could be the Wallbox ego joy, and I would say well done. And hopefully I give you credit for what's right. It's more of a Wallbox ego than any other ego to think of. All right, thank you very much, Joy, and let's find out what Tristan will tell us about Hosanna now. Well, very nice, David. Nice to hear the Wahlbergs are around. It means that they're coming south, which is always good news. So hopefully they'll be back on our side fairly shortly. They should be nearly at the end of August, beginning of September is about the right time for them as well as the booted eagles, they should be arriving, or arrived already, so it'll be a good time. Right, Hosanna has been lying facing us the whole time, posing with his foot on a stump, and has now decided to turn around. So I'm just going to go around quickly so we can see him better, because we've got the light behind him. He's still on the mound, the sun is slowly going downwards, but I really don't think he's going to be up there for all that much longer. He's starting to look as though he's getting a little on the twitchy side of life where he wants to start thinking about moving. But this light on him at the moment is spectacular, which I will show you shortly. Look at this. Is that not absolutely beautiful? Hello, boy. Are you posing for us as nicely as one could ever ask for? It seems like it. It seems like he's got this posing thing down pat. Wherever, whatever school he went to for posing, He's definitely doing a good job of it. He's really kind of gets it right. He gets onto these beautiful mounds from time to time and really does look fantastic when he's up on them. Catherine, he is so relaxed. We're so fortunate that we have a leopard like this. I mean, there's, like I say, many, many guides that spend a lot of their time working in a lot of different game reserves 
that will never get to spend time with a leopard the way we get to spend with Hosanna. And so we are more than fortunate with what goes on with this cat and, and the fact that we get to see him the way that we do. It really is a very, very, very special thing that we get to follow him as much as what we do. Right, now, I believe that our flare image looks very cool as he sits on top of the mound, as he graces us with his kind of beauty. And you can see how hot he is, as well as how hot the termite mound is. It's pretty cool to actually see it, the way that he's sitting up there. And you can see that there are parts of the termite mound, the exterior parts that are a little bit cold, but otherwise his rosette's very, very hot. And the termite mound, very hot to the rest of the bush around him, cold. So it gives you an idea of just how hot a termite mound is. It's kind of registering the same heat as him in the sun, which gives you a good indication of how warm they are during, in relation to the rest of the bush around them. I mean, there's not too much vegetation around him, but what vegetation there is, you can hardly see when he's sitting like that. But, Sana, what is a fly, boy? He's going to yawn, which is a, an indication that maybe, just maybe, Hosanna is going to start thinking about moving, which would not surprise me at all, given that he's been sitting on this mound for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, should I say. He is not the most chilled cat when it comes to afternoon activities, and so he's got places to be, things to see, things to hunt, go to look at, and so I wouldn't be surprised if that's why he's contemplating going on a bit of a walk about now. Oh, is that not ridiculously beautiful? Hosanna? Are you adorning all your fans, boy? Looks like it. Just kind of peering over his shoulder at the moment, listening to some Franklins that are alarm calling behind us. Now, I don't think they're alarm calling at him. So the reason the rosettes were warmer, Jennifer, is because they're black. And so the black rosettes are heating up quicker than the white and gold fur that he's got on him, or yellowish fur. And so therefore he's got darker, or I mean hotter spots showing around that black area. It's, it's much like if you have a black jersey on as opposed to a white jersey and you go stand in the sun, you're going to feel much hotter, much quicker in the black coloration. It absorbs light a lot more, or absorbs heat, should I say, a lot more. And so that's why to a nighttime period and the sun goes down the rosettes go completely the same as as the coat very quickly actually as the sun sets it doesn't take long at all so it's only just because the sun is hitting that area and it's being more light as well more heat is being absorbed by the black coloration than the rest but it's that's the only reason is that it's a darker color in contrast to the rest of the body that is the whites and gold tones which reflects light a lot more than what black does so that's why you'll see a lot of interesting things with um things like frogs and particularly a foamless tree frog, where it actually will go from a, a darkish grey colour and it will change to white during the course of the day to try and reflect light and to make it lose less moisture. But very cool to see. Amazing, isn't it? This FLIR is the most amazing camera. It really has saved our bacon in many respects. So I know it sounds funny, but over the course of the past few weeks where we've been out at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock, where it's dark, and then even to the night without this flare, we would have lost half the amount of animals that we've seen and we wouldn't have gained some intimate kind of knowledge into a lot of things that have gone on. So, you know, we've seen like the Inkahuma female with her little wound on her, on her hip. Now it's either showing much hotter because of, a ref of an infection or because it's lacking insulation of the fur itself. And so that's why you're seeing that hot spot kind of glowing the way it is but it's interesting to see all right Hosanna is it time to walk now are we going to the pan to go and indulge everybody hmm I think so right that's my head let's get that out the way now Megan I hope that while we drive we're going to keep comms because it's my little earpiece thingy where it plugs in that's a bit dodgy and so if it wiggles too much then I lose comms but it will be interesting to see if how we drive if it stays okay i've tried to tape it and make a good kind of thing but anyway while we carry on with our cat it sounds like david in the masai mara well he's found his cats for the afternoon well from one predator to more or many predators in the mara triangle and we've got a couple of lions here you can see that one panting there through the grass and this pride is what we call the marsh pride. This is the marsh pride where we are. I've counted about five of the marsh pride. 
And I think depending on the age or the size of the lion, you can see that panting compared to the one we saw before. I chose the one we saw earlier. You see the difference in panting? One is much faster than the other. Could it be difference in age? Difference in size? Having different amount of food in the tummy? One is like up, down, up, down. See that, that one there? And then actually if you go to the left, you see, see that one there? You see that one? That's a little much faster panting than the other one. And again, sorry, you might hear some noise in the background of another car just moving, coming to enjoy. This is much slower. It's like this kind of breathing is between or panting is between the two there. Like I've got a scar there, I think. I saw a scar on that back right leg. And things will happen sometimes when they claw each other. You get females, you know, fighting amongst among us themselves. So that happens once in a while. And or it could be teething. Even great lions are so cool. And when you see them in such an area in the grass, having eaten and they're just laying there and blending in so well event, I would say yes. Who would not want to see lions in such a place? And I've always said, any day I see lions is a beautiful day, is a great day. They're just laying down here, of course, because of the heat of the day. And as it cools off, they might be moving. But this marsh pride is always very big, over 10 of them. Here I've counted about five, and we tend to think maybe another five would be not very far from here. And if you're lucky, we might see the coalition of the boys or the males that's always coming around to mate with these females here. If you go back to the lions, Archie, that you call the triangle boys. Sorry about my head there. My friends told me about this marsh pride laying down here. Otherwise, it's very easy just to drive and miss them when they're especially they're flat down in the grass there. The wind is picking up. You can see the grass being blown by the wind there. Should be another car just passing not very far from me. I was enjoying the beauty of the lions. And again, as I said, this was a tail flicking up of the marsh pride. Sometimes as guys you get frustrated when you look for a, you know lions and you miss them. But sometimes if you see a tail flick up like that, you know there could be something. Steve, let us know. I'm going to try and reposition so they could see them better in a different way. But Steve got something for us. Yes, we do. We have found a beautiful bird down in the Umulwati drainage system. I wonder how many of the viewers out there have got their bird books with them today and are willing to try and identify this bird for me. It's a very pretty bird. You can see him there. The red beak. The whitish sort of chest. Really only confused with two. And the light is not great. Craig, actually, I think you're right, Craig, eh? The light is not great, but, um... Oh, did you hear him calling? What is he calling there? Off he goes. Oh, there he stopped in the tree. Very good, there he is. Ravinda, it is definitely a kingfisher. There we go. He's given us a much nicer view of himself. Ravinda, definitely not a malachite. Definitely not a malachite kingfisher. Malachite is completely blue. Brown, Sushin, you reckon a brown hooded kingfisher? That was my original thought. And um, I'm still thinking it is. But by the fact that there's a bit more sort of brown on the lower belly, I'm actually going to go with a, almost a grey headed. He's got a brown on the belly. It's not the most. He should have a bit more streaking on the chest if it is a brown hooded kingfisher. But the light, you see, the light is showing he's got that collar there on his neck, which is obviously normally something you see with the brown hooded. But it's very interesting because I've got a few pictures here that show a, a grey headed looking very similar. So, very hard to actually ascertain right now we need to get a another view of him 
but we could hear him calling before so let's see if we can play this call into my microphone definitely didn't sound like a brown hooded kingfisher call that was him calling me well that was me calling on my phone Mm, James, no, not yet. We wouldn't get woodlands here yet, and woodlands are very, very different in their color. You wouldn't be able to confuse uh, a woodland with these two, with the gray-headed and the brown hooded. I have seen a gray-headed before in the drainage here, and Craig has actually, sh he thought as we landed here, it was a gray-headed. Oh, and he's gone. But let me show you the two pictures here. On the dash, I've got to wipe my screen again, sorry greasy fingers for some reason. Here is a beautiful picture of the two and you can see the grey headed on the left. The beaks are very similar and uh, you see the collar I was talking about on the brown hooded but the grey headed has also got it over there and when he flew over he definitely had a very blue 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 purplish blue on the back versus a light turquoise blue over here and the beak looked to be uniformly red rather than a little bit of a tip on the red so normally I've noticed them because the the belly on the gray headed has got a very half sort of centered belly very very brown in the belly but look if I change this picture look at that suddenly he's got a very low brown belly so and look at that so very very similar indeed but I'm I'm gonna go with you Craig on your initial idea and say gray headed Kingfisher any of you out there disagree with me you're welcome to to send through your comments but definitely quite a special bird we don't get to see too many of them I've seen this is probably my third time here in Juma seeing one but before that only seen it a handful of times in my life whereas the brown hooded's are very very common okay well we're going to keep going down the Umawati and see where we get to in the meantime let's go and see what the little chief is up to Well, the little chief is in the most beautiful golden light that you can imagine. He's just sitting, watching, slowly strolling through the long wintry grass, and there's this backlight that's coming down, and isn't that just the most spectacular scene of him? He really has spoilt us with beauty, and he kind of... The thing about him is that he's active at these times of the day when the light is so good, and that's why we often get these amazing kind of screenshots. I've seen lots of you have been posting lots of screenshots about him, and there's been some amazing views of this little cat between all of us. We've all been very, very fortunate. Now, what are you doing, Hosanna? Are you going to come our way? Please come our way. Looks like he's going to. See, he's got his little tail up. That's because he's being shouted at by a forktail drongo. Oh, that is beautiful. Petru, you never know. Um, it's obviously a very difficult thing to 100% to say yes or no. I, 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 yes, there will be, I suppose there will be a bit of a change in his personality and his behavior um, as he becomes more dominant. He's obviously going to have to do a lot more work to be able to... Wait, he's going to come this way. Let's just reverse back so we don't block his path so that he can go where he wants to go. Sorry, boy. I didn't know which way you wanted to go. More? Okay. I can go more so you know he's gonna have to become a dominant male which means that he's gonna have to you know at some point defend his territory which means he can't be as nice to other leopards as he is he's also you know mating is going to change that whole thing testosterone so his behavior will change slightly and he won't be quite the same leopard that we know today which is a little bit of a shame in some respects I hope that he's still quite an active cat and moves around and hunts a lot and does his thing and catches a lot of different prey items. I hope that that's the case, but you never know with him. It's going to be an interesting kind of look at his behavior as he develops and becomes a dominant individual. Hopefully we do get to look at it and we get to watch it from where we are here and that it doesn't happen away from us where we can't see him and can't follow him. Now, Hosanna, do you really have to go there? Yes, I do have to go there. Okay. Well, it's going to be a very difficult time to follow him through where he's heading. That is not an easy place that he is going at all. So we're going to try and kind of figure it out. Now, a lot of you might remember a sighting of Tumba under that very, very tree. We had an epic sighting of Tumba the one day sitting right there. Now, I'm going to try and catch up with him because once he goes in here, if I don't stay with him, we're going to lose him very quickly. So while I 
do that and try and keep up with the little chief as he takes us on a walkabout for the afternoon. Let's send you back across to David who is just bumbling about. What a beautiful world they got now. The temperatures have gone down and we have magnificent light. And I'm trying to imagine every cut I've seen today. Well, not many cuts, just the lions. It will be time for them now to rise and shine. And I also got some wind also. Someone might have spotted the Triangle Boys. I was talking about the Marsh Pride earlier. And in this particular area we have the Mara Triangle. It has different prides of lions. The Marsh Pride is one of them. There's another pride called the Breakaway Marsh Pride. We got the Ololo Marsh Pride. There's another pride called the Mogoro Pride. And what I'm thinking, what I'm saying, is a particular four males that you call the Triangle Boys that will always meet with these uh, different sets of prize of lions. So if we are lucky, we might be driving in that direction and we might be able to see the coalition of the Triangle Boys. This is a and Monique of the Mia Cuts would be the Mungus. Sounds good? So Mia Cuts, maybe in South Africa, maybe on the final control, you might correct me, but in East Africa and more so in Kenya, I don't think we have any Mia Cuts and any close species to that would be the Mungus. We got the banded or the striped Mungus, we got the dwarf Mungus. Those are what we would call our Mia Cuts. We have seen them once in a while the mungus, yes, I'm talking about standing on their hind legs and looking like this, sometimes like squirrels. So, just yes, Monique, uh, I do not think we have any meerkats in East Africa. I had seen a rainbow earlier. I don't know why the rainbow has gone. Let me turn around. I don't know how bright it looks, but I thought Archie saw a rainbow. Now it's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, you see those beautiful birds flying up in the sky. How high are they? They look like egress to me, but I know you have your magic, Archie. Very good. Those are egrets flying away there, and I got a feeling they are heading all the way to South Africa, and they might request Steve to tell us something small or big about the meerkats. Yes. Hello, everybody. Well, I do have an answer for the meerkats. Here is, first of all, a picture of the meerkats in their very sort of upright standing pose. Tony did that the other day. And here, there's their beautiful shape. And here is how they're distributed across South Africa. They're very much sort of to the west, to the Namibian side, down that west coast and sort of in the middle of the country and they come all the way down to the eastern cape but they don't overlap with the low felt the low felt would transition all the way around on the other side there so no meerkats where we are and if i show you a picture of where the banded mongoose or the white mongoose for example here here the banded mongoose there we go you can see the overlap over here the, the whole of the low felt into mozambique they sort of fill that sort of niche of where the meerkats would fill in the west. So kind of a very similar sort of species and they outcompete each other by just avoiding. So one is here, the other one is there. So they don't coexist. That's obviously over a very long time. I hope that answers your questions about the meerkats. I do believe that um, Wild Earth was involved in meerkat stuff for a while, hey Craig? They were meerkat filming stuff. I don't know the history but I think they did. Graham had, I know there's a picture of Pete, our, um, one of our technical directors, walking around with one of these very interesting cameras filming the meerkats on the ground. If I'm not mistaken. Hmm, I do. I don't know if it was Meerkat Manor who produced Meerkat Manor. Could it have been Graham? I'm sure someone out there knows. Okay. Hello, zebras. I don't 
don't run, guys. They're a little bit skittish because we're on our fire break right now, our southern fire break. And this morning when Seb and I set up the drone for our night tracking and our search and ID with a thermal imaging camera, uh, we heard lions roaring from the south. And we were very excited to try and find out who they were. And so we came flying all the way down to pretty much where we are now. And uh, we found the whole Unkuhuma pride moving in the same direction we're moving at the moment. So their tracks are all over the road here. Um, their bellies were quite full. Maybe they ate something the size of a zebra or a water buck. It's hard to say. But what we do know is that the male lions were calling on the eastern side, on the Torchwood Cheetah Cut Lion boundary. And every time they called, these lions would run. They would move even quicker. So obviously that's what made me think it was the evokers and not the Birmingham boys. And Tristan went into the area and indeed found at least one evoker male. And the, yeah, the Unkuhumas aren't too interested in hanging out with the evokers just yet. They first need to prove themselves and they are not the fathers of any of the kids or the youngsters in the pride. So there's a bit of risk involved. And so no doubt these zebras can smell where the lions were. And James with Craig came here in the morning and followed them all the way to the west where they crossed out. Obviously, though, before later they came back and Tristan got that wonderful morning of all of them coming back and rejoining each other. And the pride is now once again complete. The ox pecker in tow. And the zebra feeding quite low to the ground. They have the ability to crop the grass because they've got teeth on the top and the bottom of the, the front jaw which enables them to actually chew the grass down and they facilitate better feeding for a lot of the other animals. That would be really annoying, wouldn't it? Having a bird clinging to your face. Okay, well it looks like we're going to go quickly over to Tristan and the little chief. Well, the little uh, prince is now hunting something. He's been focused. He's been using the sandbank to walk. You can see the tails twitching. And we had him just now leopard crawling all the way along the sand. And it was amazing kind of to watch his patience and his stealth. Now, I think he spotted something like a a diker maybe in front of us there's a jackalberry in up in front that's ahead of him a big tall jackalberry that has fruits that often drop onto the floor and that means that you you know you'll find a number of different antelopes that will come and eat so nyalas dikers those kind of things that will move in that direction and they will then feed off those and this is a great place for a leopard to be able to hunt i can't see anything yet and so i'm wondering if maybe just maybe there isn't some sort of sign now i can also hear on the radio that tingana has been found at philemon's dip so if steve is around megan maybe just pass on the message i don't hear him on the radio so i'm not sure if he's got his radio on but Tingana is at Philemon's dip if Steve does want to go into that direction which I'm sure he does I know he has been looking for Tingana most of the afternoon right now I wonder what's going on here I just want to try and just sneak forward a little bit just to see around this bend what he's watching but it was amazing to kind of see him he was down on his tummy and he was just crawling look 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 you see how he uses the noise of the car which is naughty a little bit but he's learning and a lot of the leopards out here are have learned this behavior let's just see where he's gonna go now it looks like he's going to keep going straight what's that there there's something there that's close to the jackalberry at the base of the jackalberry I see something that's a Franklin okay that's not what he's looking at he's looking at something here though for sure he's just trotted off to my left hand side so there he is there now what are you, what have you seen boy he's definitely stalking something now Let's just see how long it's going to take him to get closer. I was so worried that we might lose him here. There he goes. He's walking quite quickly now and it's not really that covered. So I don't know what he spotted. Maybe it bolted off before he got there. Or he's just in one of those moods. But he definitely was stalking something. There was an intent to his walk and the way that he was going about things. And that telltale sort of tail dangle that he does or wiggle is normally quite good sign that something's going on but let's just keep pushing forward there's some ellies somewhere close by too because i can hear them and there's lots of evidence of them digging around here in the Mawati. so i wonder where they are maybe that's what he's watching 
Sana, what do you see? He's just on our left-hand side. There he is. So he's just watching. I'm trying to stay. There he goes. Look at that. He's now trotting forward. I don't see anything running in front of him. So we're going to try and keep up with him. It really can be quite tricky when he's hunting like this because he covers ground much faster than what we can and he moves through these thickets much faster than we can. The good thing is, is that if we stay down here in the drainage line, I'm quite happy because most of the animals are used to us driving on this road. They don't care too much for us moving in this direction. They're actually quite used to us all driving here and so we're not going to spook too much if we do. Now he's on my left hand side, back left is where he is. I still don't see any sign of a prey animal. Their eyesight is just unbelievable. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Eye level with a stalking leopard is quite spectacular. There he goes. Now, Megan, I'm not sure what he's hunting, but maybe let's take this to all the other platforms that we're on so more people can watch the amazing leopard stalk that is taking place at the moment. Oh, there it is. There's what he's hunting. It's a dikey in front. So we're going to quickly go live. So I'm going to hold off speaking for a little bit. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this live broadcast from Africa. At the moment, what you're looking at is a whole bunch of grass and leaves, but hidden inside there is a male leopard that is busy hunting. What he's doing is he's stalking along very slowly. There's a prey animal straight in front of us that he's busy trying to get closer to, and it takes all of his guile and his agility to try and sneak through these thickets and try and then ambush this animal. The animal, like I say, is just sitting right in the middle of a riverbed, a dry riverbed, and it is the perfect place for a leopard to be able to try and stalk forward. Now, I don't see him there. I wonder if he's still kind of coming forward. He was creeping slowly. The dike in front hasn't really seen anything. Now it's just run off, so I wonder if he's going to move a little bit. We're gonna try and just catch up with that in case he's run off. Now, my name is Tristan, and on camera I've got Ferg, and we are coming to you live, which means that you can interact with us, and you can do so by going posting questions or comments in the comment section below. There he is, look, he's just stalking. So he's nice and low to the ground. Look, you see him there? So he's, there he is. Now look at that camouflage, isn't that amazing? He's just sneaking through the thickets and staying as low as possible so as not to give himself away. It's very cool to witness when you watch leopards move like this. I'm gonna try and just get a little bit further forward. You can see the sun is slowly setting as well, which is a good time. There he is, he's straight in that gap, which is nice. So there he is. He's going to try and get low, low, low. Look at his head that's down. Now this is a very kind of good, well, unique view of a leopard hunting because generally you look down on them a little bit, but we are eye level with him as he's going and watch how he's gonna place his paws slowly and delicately, making sure that he's not making too much noise. And he's watching, trying to calculate where's this diker going to move? Is it going to go left? Is it going to go right? And try and get himself into a place where he can ambush it. Now a leopard is not fast like a cheetah that can run incredibly quickly. It needs to position itself that the diker comes very, very close and it can then grab it from there. So they try and get into a pathway of that diker and then they sit and wait. And as it comes closer, they'll then try and use that incredible turn of speed and burst out and catch the animal unaware. So he is a very good diker hunter. He's been hunting a lot of late. And so he's looking around. Now, I wonder if that diker didn't bound off a little bit further than he initially thought because he's popped up quite high now. And generally when a leopard is very close, it stays as low as possible so as not to be seen. Giselle, you say, wow, how beautiful. Well, they are one of the most beautiful animals. In fact, my favorite animal that we have out here, their coats are incredibly pretty. And so it is a beautiful scene to kind of watch this leopard ghosting through these thickets. Sun is setting in the background. It's the perfect time of day for a leopard to be on the hunt. Look at that. And you see how well his camouflage works. That broken patterned outline just makes him blend in very well. Now, Elben, no, our noise is not disturbing him. This particular leopard has grown up around cars and around people talking and so he doesn't really focus on us at all. What we need to do is just try and keep our voices down so that we don't disturb his hunt too much and it's why we kind of stay back a little bit and allow him to walk in the direction that he wants to go and also not try to get too close to his prey animal. Now the last time I saw the prey animal that he was hunting was just kind of coming from this section here and it just bounded up onto the top. So it went in the direction of where he is. I just want to go a little bit further. There it goes, there it goes. It just ran across. Now hopefully he Oh, I think he missed, unfortunately. 
Now, you know, his success rate, well, the success rate of leopards is better than sometimes lion and cheetah, but still not great. So they only could kill about 30% of the animals that they actually hunt. But that dike, I think, saw him and ran because it just burst through here. Now, I don't know where he's gone. He might have chased it. I've lost him now. But he should be somewhere here. He, normally with a leopard, when they miss, they stop straight away and they watch where that diker maybe went. I think let's just go back again a little bit. There's a little gully here that he might have been in and that's where he could have maybe missed. But I didn't see him cross onto this side. Now, he would have, if he was right behind the diker, would have crossed the, this riverbed, which he hasn't. So I think he must still be sitting somewhere close by and maybe he just, there he is. So he's popped his head up now he, a little bit more. Forward, okay. So we've got to go forward. Fergus is telling me. There we go. So he's just watching where that diker ran. I don't think he's got much of a chance now. The diker has sensed that there is a leopard around and is very wary. It went bolting, and so I think it saw him and has now run off. Unfortunately, they are very, very aware animals, and they often do pick up leopards long before. A leopard actually can get too close. Anyway, it was an amazing thing to watch. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. If he does continue to hunt, we will surely go live once again. But hopefully we'll see you all another time sometime soon. Right, well, unfortunately he missed. I'm sure he's going to keep hunting and hopefully he'll get a meal. In the meantime, let's send you across to Steve, who sounds like he's caught up with Tingana. Yes, well, here he is, the Duke of Juma himself. Moving in a northy direction, just like his son. There must be some nice wind that he is following. I don't know how we're going to follow him now. Okay, well, let's go back. Oh, see that owl? Look at that. Spotted eagle owl. Just startled him out of the bush here. How beautiful is that? Okay, well, we're going to have to keep up with the Duke, though, so sorry that I'm moving off. He has gone into very interesting drainage. You're gonna to have to try and find an access. I don't know if you've seen an access here before, Craig, eh? Maybe he'll come out, maybe he'll cross. If we can find an area to cross, then we will take it. There he is over there. Okay, I think it narrows a little bit. This is a, sorry about the bumps, Craig. This is a, a bit of a, a drainage depression that uh, Tundi really enjoyed frequenting with little Tlalamba. We spent a lot of time with her just down there. Got some amazing shots. I think we might have some access just here. There he is, right in front of us. Probably going to follow this drainage line for a little while, so it's tricky to know if we should cross or not. I think he's looking for dakers and small antelope that might secret themselves inside a little drainage depression like this. This is always where the tricky part comes. Do you follow him in or do you wait on the other side? Okay, well, while we try and find an access here he's going over there try and get his d general direction this big male the dominant male leopard of Juma looks like David has found himself a big male lion well I was earlier talking about the triangle boys and these boys are tough boys what am I talking about they got five, six different sets of prey of lions they met with. This particular one that you see here, look at its tail carefully. Archie, if you could be a good boy, I know you are always very kind and good boy. If you notice, the tail is cut. And this particular one is called the short tail. The total number of the triangle boys are four. 
what we have now here we got two this one the short tail turning around and I think either to the left arch very good and this is called the fang I do not know where the other two are but they are always four is always a coalition of four strong males and they have been in charge and ruling this territory for a long time they have dealt with any other coalition of males in like minutes you can tell the strong men lots of flies on them all those black spots you see there are flies very good touchy and as you can see the wind picking up but the wind is not strong enough to blow the flies away eh? but you can see the mohawk and the main being blown by the wind together with the grass not panting as much like the females we saw earlier as much as the males tend to be bigger and stocky and heavier than the females but this is quite a cool you know panting as much as the temperatures have tremendously dropped very typical location for them to see the you know the lions under a tree and Megan in the final control says awesome because earlier when it was hot they definitely needed the shade of that tree that's called a boskia tree and they're not very far from the females Nikita, how are you? And you you would want to the Scarface is still around. Yes, the last I heard of Scarface was about uh, let me see, about a week ago, Nikita. I heard about Scarface and apparently he was meeting and he had two females with him. Uh and since then for the last one week I haven't seen him, I haven't been able or heard any news about him. But Scarface is around. And I'm sure Nikita, you know Scarface. He's a big boy, huge man. Sometimes we have called him, you know, Bob Mali because of his huge mohawk that comes out like that and that he falls on his shoulders. Yes, Nikita, Scarface is still around and I think, you know, live and kicking. And it would compare Scarface to the main of this uh if you look sorry, there's a helicopter there passing of us and I think those are just the game rangers doing their normal patrol and we'll move from these two cuts here and go to a spotted cut all the way in South Africa Well, these are not spotted cats, of course. These are impalas, which are often eaten by spotted cats here. They are having a drink at the Juma Pan and that is because it has been a very warm and pleasant afternoon and impala, especially in the dry season, are highly water dependent creatures. This is the first time you've heard from me today. My name is James and I'm sitting not actually in the waterhole. I'm sitting in a tent not too far from the waterhole and I'm enjoying the scenes that our nest cameras are producing here. Yes, Paula, the pretty sky indeed. It is a magnificent afternoon, just the right temperature. The cold front left us earlier today and was replaced by clear skies and lovely springish temperatures, shall we say. The Impala, you can see, are deeply appreciative of the fact that the foulness of the last few days have disappeared from the sky. Well, yes, Giraffesville, dinner for Hosanna indeed. He has tried possibly this very herd of impala at this very pan any number of times, but he hasn't managed to get one here just yet. And I'm not sure that he will. They're very wily, and there just seems to be not quite enough cover leading up to the pan. So I think there are probably easier impala meals to be had elsewhere on the reserve other than at this water. But Diker certainly he's had success with here. He's eaten a terrapin too, which I imagine was fairly smelly. You can see the sun just sunk there on this perfect Sunday afternoon. In mid-August, if you can believe it. Yes, Paula, the reflections in the water are delightful, as are the ripples. There's something about water that makes us human beings feel at peace, feel comforted. I know that when people go to the bush, they almost always have their sundowners or drinks near water or their picnics. 
and that's obviously in the hope that they can watch some animals but at the same time it just gives them sort of a, a peaceful feeling I think I'm not really sure why that should be the case possibly because we need to drink it I wouldn't suggest you have any drink out of this particular pan because I think you'll get quite sick quite quickly now we've got male leopards galore all over the place let's go back to the older one now While well, the Duke himself, after a spattering of rain, is walking his domain scent marking, um, he might call soon. If he gets spotted by any prey animal, he might call, as we've seen him do before. But after territorial spraying, any form of moisture will wash away his scent, so he will re need to re scent mark and re sort of uh, indicate that he is still the Duke, the reigning member. He's moving, looking for some food. He doesn't look extremely full. But we know these leopards are always very opportunistic. He knows he's got to move. He's probably been waiting all day as he goes around the corner there. Tristan had some tracks of him this morning, scent marking. Not far from where we found Osana. And uh, so that he would have done as soon as the rain had fallen so as to basically eliminate any competition of a rival male moving in. Because if a rival male moves in and doesn't smell the fresh scent mark, well, he'll think this area is available and up for grabs. Nottingana doesn't want that. He'd rather allow the individual to walk into a wall of fresh leopard scent to obviously weed out the weak from the strong. Quite commonplace with most territorial animals that use scent marking. Here he is, walking beautifully in front of us. Mr. Nom, he is a very big boy. He's a beautiful boy. Now we're going to stop for you one second. He's going to rub his face in this bush. They do quite like the guari bushes. He's going to rub his face and he's going to do his characteristic backward urine spray. But still no calling, because I suppose while he's on this territorial prowl, he might uh, catch himself some dinner while he's at it. And so him rubbing his face is giving his, the, the gland on the face a wipe on the plant as well as the urine. And to us, we could maybe smell, we'd smell the sweetness of the leopard scent, but we wouldn't be able to tell exactly what's going on. But to leopards, they know everything. They'll smell it and they'll pick up on, on the sex, on the size, on the maturity, on all of those, all of those attributes that we can only, we can't even fathom. Well, it seems like David has positioned himself in a beautiful spot to watch the sunset. Let's go over to him for a quiet moment. Well done, Steve Ovo, for getting Hosanna, the Duke of that area. What a beautiful leopard he is, especially with his big dewlap. And we are having a great sunset here. Look at that beauty of the Mara. Very good job, Archie. See how Archie does his magic on the camera work, showing us the Ololo escarpment in the background there. That hill you see there, or that escarpment you see there, is called Ololo. I'm sure you can be able to see Ololo, the escarpment, the savanna, the open, you know, grassland, and the lions together. Excellent, very good job. And we are back to a coalition of the Triangle Boys. And the one on the right is the short tail. You can see the short tail. Did you hear me? Tail up again if you want to. Joy, I like the way you're phrasing your question because it's true. That short tail. I would say it's kind of a disadvantage for him to keep the flies out. It's just like having an elephant with some short trunk. You need the whole length and the whole how the body works, you know, how the brain works to relate to the flies and to communicate up to the very end of the tip of the tail as it moves it. And Joy, I would agree with you. I mean, that is a downside for it to keep away the flies. 
if he was a cheetah, I would say it could even be more of a disadvantage because cheetahs will use their tail sometimes as a rudder, but luckily lions do not do that. But I agree with you, Joy, totally, that that's a big disadvantage for, you know, for the short tail to use his tail to flick away the flies. Look at the amount of flies, Joy, he got on his body. My guess is if I was a short tail, it's just to roll over and maybe crush or kill as many as he can. See what he's doing, Joy? Do you see that? And I'm not sure that is of much help. But being a leaf flex, feeling that that's what it's meant to do, whether the flies go or not, he just keeps flicking the tail. I'm not sure in my next life I'd want to be a lion and just stay there and enjoy life, not wondering what could happen to me. Well done, short tail. What do you want to do now? Turn around? Or just toes? Oh no. Yeah, I feel sorry for short tail because of that. I don't know how much flies he gets out of his body by doing that. And funny enough, the one on the left, the fang, Archie, does it have as many flies? I don't know how I'd be able to explain this. Yeah, Joy, if you look, you know, the other nice viewers, if you look on these two abdomens of these two boys here, one, the short tail, has more flies than the fang, lion. He got a few, a few scars, as you can see there, but not as many flies. I don't know how I'd be able to explain that. Let's go back to that one there. You see, more invasion of the flies than the fang. Is it edge? Do they got something? Or are they getting something they're not getting on the other, you know, on the fang? What are they sucking? Definitely they're feeding on something there. And I'll be trying to investigate this and find out. And a spotted cut with Tristan. Well, we are still with Hosane, but he is going to go, unfortunately, where a vehicle can't go if he carries on in his course now. He's, he's mobile kind of in a northwesterly direction now into the drainage line of Ingwe Alley, which is normally f can kind of pass through in places, but where he's gone is, I'm afraid, impenetrable. It really is going to be impossible to follow him from here. The only way to do it would be to maybe try get around the other side onto Ingwe Alley and wait for him there but I don't know which direction he's going it seems like he spotted something so I don't think we're going to be able to keep up with him at all I'm afraid which is a bit of a pity let's try and see I, it seems like there might be a little gap there Oof, I don't know if we're going to be able to I've tried this once before and I remember I didn't get very far and I'm not sure if I'm going to be stupid or brave trying to do this again because I'm pretty sure I know what the outcome of this is going to be is that uh, I'm not going to be able to get to him. Do you see on the top there though, if you come out a bit, Ferg, there's a big marula that's at the back in the background. So there you see it. Now that's where Ingwe Alley Road runs, so it's not too far. So I think let's rather go that way than trying to crash through here. I don't think we're going to get this right. I re like I say, I remember that this will just be stupidity rather than bravery to do this because we're just not going to get anywhere. All right, while we do that, let's send you across to Steve who's with H Tingana. And I'm actually quite interested to know where Tingana is, given that Hosanna is mobile northwest. Yes, well... He's gone a lot more west than he was initially going. Trist, we're now on Rebecca's road after getting through that very interesting drainage. He's now mov moving sort of west towards Zoe's, I think anyway, <laughs> from my recollection of the road. We've just popped out in it, but I think we're coming up towards the sort of Rebecca's and Zoe's junction. But he's walking in the road now, thankfully. We've had to do some interesting sideways, well, not sideways, but interesting up and down Passaging? Passaging? Is that even a word? <laughs> but now he's walking beautifully in the road. He still hasn't called, but he's been scent marking deliberately as he goes. Yes, so we're exactly where I thought we were. Exactly where I thought we were. There's a big junction here with Mrs. Rebecca's and there's Zoe's road. And that road over there goes all the way to the west. In the area where the Unkuhumas are quite normally quite busy. 
in Ghana. There's impalas just over there, my son. Okay, well, there are impala just ahead of us here, through the thickets on the right and on the left. Grace, you want to know if Hosanna will be will take over from Tingana? You know, it's not normally what happens, Grace. What normally happens is a male leopard gets pushed away from his natal area and he moves off to go and get stronger and eventually breed far away from his sort of genetic line. Okay, well, he spotted those impala. This could be very exciting. It's quite a nice area with regards to, to being able to keep up with him. It might be worth inviting a few more viewers, Megs. There's two small herds of impala, one on the right and one on the left. And he's going very low. He's not being very stealthy at the moment. But cats like to use the roads to mask their scent with regards to the footfalls. But he doesn't seem to be too bothered. Let's give it a moment and see if those impala spot him. There we go. Okay, that's what he likes to do. As soon as he gets spotted, he calls. Oh well, I've been spotted. I might as well let everybody know where I am. And that's what he just did. He's not very interested in food right now. He's on a territorial mission. Yeah, sorry Meg. So I, I thought he might be interested in the Impala there, but he's more interested in demarcating a territory. Yeah, well, just move over here. Maybe get a bit of a two-shot with the Impala and the Leopard. Look at how defiantly close the Impala actually come. This is awesome stuff. They're not too worried about a cat that they can see. That very high-pitched nasal alarm call. Of, of an impala. Not to be confused with the rutting call. The rutting call is a bit more drawn out. This one is a whole lot of animals shouting at the same time. And look how he defiantly just walks. He doesn't care. This is his spot. Excuse me one second while we just talk on the radio. Uh, best approach. Tristan is dealing with that. Someone was looking for us and this leopard. Tristan has managed to talk to him before we have, so that's great. And I'll give another little update. As soon as we see where he turns at the corner there. You live another day in parlors, live another day. They're quite happy that they spotted him. I'll even follow him until they can't see him anymore. I'll keep moving and keep moving. Which way are you going to go, my boy? I think he's going to turn right there. Yes, he is. Zephyr, that's exactly it. The confidence that he exudes is incredible. He's still showing it. He's given up the limp that he had. Keep following him around the corner here. It's lovely hearing those uh, impala shouting. Just going to change out of low range. Give me one second. Here he walks. So let me just give an update. The you know, station of Singana is now mobile directly along Zoe's Road towards quarantine area. One station unlock. Okay. There he goes. He's basically walking an entire route. He's going to walk an entire route. He's obviously, he's done it many times before. 
very good chance he's going to walk straight past the Galago sort of area and up into the north again because he's going to demarcate everything that is his. So a lot of the viewers love the sawing sound. It is one of the nicest sounds in the African wilderness to hear a sawing. I love hearing it when I wake up in the morning or hearing it when I just out any time in the day really. Hang on a second. Zonzo is now a mobile north towards quarantine area. Okay, so let's keep up with him. He might call again, not sure. But it's mainly the demarcation of the territory through the urine that's important. That is sort of a, a one week to two week sort of maintenance until there's some more rain, that is. The calling though is an immediate response. So basically by calling, he's indicating to all of the other leopards around that he is here right now. And there we go. Let me just watch him con continue walking down the road. This beautiful big male leopard. Let's go back to David, who's still with a big male lion. Well, Tingana, you have a competitor here. Look at the size of this huge uh, male here. And he is so big. Sorry about that. And... This is the short tail. He decided to wake up, repositioned himself, and look at the short tail there. And Fang is right behind him. And if you look at both of them, you can see there's a huge difference on their mane. Short tail got a bigger mane and much darker in color compared to Fang. I want you viewers to tell me between the two, the faces, if you don't put into account on the mane, which one looks, oh, it's a big yawn. Which one looks ferocious or which one looks friendly? I don't know what you think of that look on that face. Chambo Fang, how are you doing? Kimberly, two huge male lions, great comment there, and it couldn't be better. And this is one of the beauties of maybe coming to Africa on a safari. We earlier showed you females. We have been showing you leopards all over. And now we got two male lions, Kimberly, and it couldn't be better than this. So one of them still enjoying the nap, the other one just licking its paw, doing a bit of uh, the fang on the left there, a bit of grooming himself. Short tail, what are you thinking? And I might have mentioned earlier, the females or the pride of the marsh pride is not very far from where we are. It's about two kilometers, about a mile and a half or so from here. And sometimes the males just hung around the females so that if, you know, they go for a kill, they're guaranteed of getting some food. Fun grooming himself, much shorter mane than short tail. There's a scar there. Do you think that's actually a scar there? Holly, I will tell you for a fact, I have no idea what might have happened to his tail because since it came to the Mara, I found it, you know, that way. And there could be all the theories, you know. It could have been beaten by another male. It could have been born like that. But Holly, forgive me because I do not have a good answer for you I might find out maybe ask from my senior guides James Henry or maybe Brent who may know for a fact what might have happened to the tail we'll only guess you know as I'm saying give some theories if you go back to that tail born like that could have been a defect could have been sickness could have been beaten by another male you know males they fight you know, over territories, when they're taking over, for example, the coalitions, when they're overthrowing another coalition. So the Triangle Boys, as I said earlier, they have been doing very well. So Holly, I will not know for a fact what might have happened to it is tail. Not very many lions have seen this. We have another female around here of a different sort of pride that is called the sausage pride, where one of the females has like a kinky tail. So all these things we have always seen out here in the bush and Steve will be telling us something in South Africa. Yes, well, we have switched over to the infrared spectrum, the infrared light. 
and here is the Duke. He's just done some scent marking, and maybe he needed a little bit more of maybe number two at the same time. We managed to get around him, and he should come wandering down the road towards us. Hang on one second. He is still on the road, still mobile north. Okay, so that's just another landowner coming to join us. Should have another vehicle in the sighting shortly. I don't hear it yet though. Look at that beautiful big neck of his. It's not as pretty as his son. He's been in a few more battles. He's got enormous feet though. Look at those big feet. Here he is. What a beautiful gentleman. Walking right past us. He is a very relaxed male. And we do get to spend quite a bit of time with him, which is magical. Sorry about the back of the vehicle there. Craig doing his swivel. Let's just turn around. He's going to... You can tell, by the way, that the cat is moving. Catherine he is looking really, really good. And that limp that he had is completely gone. Completely gone, which is nice. Okay, so we have a vehicle joining us in a moment as Tingana continues on his patrol. You can tell by the fact that he's using the road and scent marking as he goes that he indeed is using it to cover more distance. It's much quicker, just like us driving on the road. I'm just going to let this vehicle know that he's coming up. Yeah, we're about 80 meters from you. If you just want to pull over on the side of the road there and he should walk past you in a few moments. We don't want to block him, obviously. Pull off, off the road so that the leopard can walk past. Don't want to block his route. Lindsay, I don't know if, if it's more concentrated um, I know that certain animals have the ability to sort of increase the concentration. Confrontation. Okay, so Lindsay, I think with regards to cats, they've got the same amount of confrontation all the time. It really just is it's a constant thing. A territory is defended all the time. It's not stopped till that animal dies or they, they pass it on or they lose it to the next individual. So the confrontations with regards to cats are happening all the time, but that's the reason why they mark territory. The marking of territory actually limits the confrontation potential. If they didn't have a territory marking, then every time they saw a leopard, they would just fight. There'd be no indicator to say occupancy. It would just be a constant battle all the time. So by using the energy to demarcate, you're indicating to others that you're there, you're strong, you're willing to fight. So there's the other vehicle. We're going to see if we can catch up with him. Always very exciting. Landowners bring their families here in the parks. They're just on the side of the road like we did and a big male leopard walking right past you. It's really, there's nothing better. Nothing better. Okay, he's inviting me to go first. Good evening. Okay, so I'm going to park on the side of the road so as to do a bit of a leap frogging. Floyd, very easy. Um, you can see how easy I drive in the road. It's very comfortable to drive on the road. Have you ever taken, I don't know Floyd if you drive, but maybe don't do it, but think about it. If you took your car and you drove on a tarmac road quite fast, it's quite comfortable, isn't it? Take your same car and drive it through the grass or through the vegetation. It's not as comfortable. You know, you, lots of obstacles, lots of things in the way. Uh, you can't move as quickly. You have to go very slowly. Um, holes, all sorts of things that can obscure you. And uh, also you'll make a lot more noise. So leopards will do it. They can cover a much greater distance by walking in the road. Uh, they're quiet. There's no obstacles. He can just walk and focus on his territory, focus on moving 
not focus on having to navigate around branches and trees and stuff and the road for example is basically just an adaptation of what game paths would be and leopards lions rhinos elephant all these animals use game paths natural game paths to navigate and it's just become the part and parcel of how these animals demarcate their territories by using roads which they just see as a big game path a big hippo path they're like well this will suit me so why don't i i'll just wave these guys past just a big game path for them to walk on and demarcate so that's exactly what they want to do okay well we are going to go back over to tristan we're going to first stay with this obviously this lovely gentleman let's go to tristan and see what his plans are for the last moments of drive well good luck and enjoy staying with him steve i'm sure steve is very happy that he found himself a leopard this afternoon and he's going to spend time with the duke as long as we have or that we're out and about unfortunately we didn't find fasana again and part of me didn't really want to find him i know that's going to sound very odd but we spent the entire afternoon with him. It's now time that he's hunting and crashing through that area there is just going to ruin his evening hunt and it's going to make it very difficult for him. So I would rather he has his own time to do what he needs to do and I would rather he has his own kind of hunting time that we don't disturb him. He gives us so much that it's better that he gets a little bit of alone time too. And he's going to go to the dam cam anyway, so you guys will get to see him a little bit later. I'm pretty sure about it, unless he kills between here and there. Monique, are there any fences up between Sabi Sound and Kruger? No, is the answer to that. Fences were dropped in 1993, if I'm not mistaken, 93 or 94. Um, and then you found that animals are now transient through so there's no fence between the two of them it allows a nice movement of animals up and down and all around and that's why we we're fortunate to be in this area because you just never know what's going to happen you never know what's coming your way we get elephants from all over the place we get new male lion blood we get new male leopards like hukumuri that came out of the kruger and so it's really important that we have an open system the bigger the system the more the animals have to roam the more natural the ecosystem becomes and the less interference man has to have in a very small system man's got to control populations because otherwise you end up with overgrazing or too many predators that kill too much so you need to have that balance and it's important that that fence is down right i'm going to carry on i'm heading my way home now towards quarantine while i do that though I'm going to send you back up to David for his last mention of the day. I believe he's still sitting with his big furry cats. Well, the marsh pride continue to give us lots of joy. And look at a mother and a youngster there just wrestling and having some good fun. I think he's one mother and two cubs. And you can tell now we are in infrared. It's getting dark and we'll always do the best we can not to interfere with their natural living style and not shining lights or spotlights on their faces. And look at how beautiful that is and the magic of infrared. That's the mother there. You will rise up. Hello there. Good lady. You only got two cubs. Shrimp, I would say we are one hour ahead of Juma in South Africa and I'm looking at my watch and it's saying it's about three minutes to seven and in Juma in Kruger National Park in South Africa it should be three minutes to six of course now it's two minutes and some 55 seconds so we have one hour difference between us here in Kenya and in South Africa. Thank you, Shrimp, for your question. And the mama has decided to go on the Taman Mount. And I'm sure the cubs will slowly and surely follow her. Hello there. Why is your other brother or sister? They rise up and maybe going to join the other pride we saw earlier. Rosaline, depending on the age of the lion, is anything three to four feet depending on the age of the lion that's an average a length of a lion tail of course it's a small little guy here could be about a foot and something but the big ones you know fully grown could be 
three going up to four feet, you know, max on the fully grown ones. Just walking in the grass there. And this is exactly what I was saying earlier. As it cools off, the cats tend to be more active and more so lions. Hello there, are you want to play or do you just want to keep mum busy? Or are you looking for anything you can feed on in the grass? Not sure you can hear that, but there's a small little call ooh, ooh, from the background there. And I'm trying to imagine maybe this one lioness here is trying to touch base with the pride we saw before. Hello there, what are you looking at? What are you thinking? Are you trying to sniff the big engine and getting all the diesel fumes? Scratching the ground there. How beautiful it is to see her just walk in the middle of the grass. And most likely they might regroup with the rest of them. Just a good jump, good play. And any day I see lions is always a great day. And today I would say it has been a day full of cuts going to South Africa, Tingana, you know, Hosanna, and the Marsh Pride here, the Triangle Boys. Fantastic. What a joy. And on behalf of all teams in South Africa and in Kenya, thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye for now.